And this other one, this is the one that some of you were asked to read before this lecture, Towards Speculative Realism. And this is a, a very engaging book by the professor Immaterialism. And also this one, The Quadruple Object. Uh, I think that this is a, a great opportunity to, to take another hard look on, on some classical uh, philosophy concepts. Uh, the, professor, the professor, Professor Hartman, is going to, to make a presentation on, on some classical concept like materialism, realism, idealism. He will make arguments against idealism and materialism. So students, uh, like I said, pay very good attention because these are the traditional classical concepts of philosophy. And the dynamics of these two sessions today and tomorrow will be as follows. First, obviously, the professor is going, is going to make his presentation about an hour, 20 minutes, maybe an hour and a half. And then we can initiate a, a session of questions, answers, and commentaries. So today's subject, I repeat, is the main thesis of the object-oriented philosophy. And tomorrow, uh, Professor Hartman is going to elaborate on some, some uh, applications of his theory to architecture and to politics and to other subjects. If one of you wants to make a question, and you can make it in Spanish, and we will translate for the professor. There's no problem. And, well, without further ado, uh, you may begin. <clears throat> Is the microphone on? Yes. Thank you all very much. I've been to Mexico twice before as a tourist. This is my first time lecturing in Mexico. I spoke once in Peru and in Argentina, never in Mexico until today. I will try to speak slowly because if you ever saw my lectures on YouTube, I'm too fast. <laughs> um, even my mother says I'm too fast. She cannot understand me. So I will try to speak slowly and I will try to say the same thing uh, in several different ways so nobody is lost. Also, uh, tomorrow I will not be able to stay as long because I have a flight from San Diego back to Los Angeles to teach in Los Angeles Wednesday morning. So today I will stay a little longer if anybody wants me to and answer any questions you might have. And again, it's wonderful to be here. Object-oriented ontology. What is this about? Well, in the first place, philosophy is different from all the other fields in that we have to be as broad as possible. In some sense, philosophy has to talk about everything. And uh, we are not the first in object-oriented ontology to use the word object to cover everything that exists. There was, of course, Alexius Meinung in Austrian philosophy 100 years ago. Uh, in fact, my use of the word object is trying to pay my debt to the Austrian tradition of Brentano, Husserl, Meinong, Twardowski, these other philosophers who are interested in objects. Usually, in everyday language, object suggests something hard, something that is durable and lasts for a long time, something that is not human or not alive, like a Coke bottle, and something that is real. 
an object oriented ontology, though we talk about humans as being objects. We're not dividing between subject and object. Object is for us the general term that means everything that exists or doesn't exist, such as fictional characters, Batman, Popeye, Darth Vader, all of these characters count as objects. Uh, numbers and other mathematical entities, objects. Uh, the Autonomous University of Baja California, an object. Each of you, an object. Myself, an object, and so forth. All right. Now, what I'm going to start by talking about is that most of Western philosophy and most of Western thought in general has been anti-object oriented. Not all of it, but a lot of it. In fact, most uh, intellectual methods have been attempts to destroy objects. And this happens in two different directions. And so I'm going to start by putting up the first of these, undermining. This is a real English word. It refers to digging under something to make it collapse. Like digging under an enemy's uh, defensive position and making it fall. Or any time you do something that sabotages something or makes it weaker, that's an undermining. What happens a lot of times with objects is people say that objects aren't real. What's real are the smallest things of which the object is built. So let's say atoms or quarks and electrons. This is what scientific materialism usually does. It says everything that we see is actually not as fundamental as the tiniest particles or strings or whatever other physical things are the smallest from which everything is made. This is a kind of undermining. And not just in science, but the dawn of what is called pre-Socratic philosophy. I'm not sure it really counts as philosophy. It's very interesting. I consider them more as early scientists than as philosophers, for reasons I will explain. Uh, Thales of Miletus, which is probably pronounced very different in Spanish. Thales or? Thales uh, Yeah, Thales de Neto. Everything is made of this, agua, water. Everything is made of water. This is the first philosopher and physicist in Western civilization. He is also an obvious underminer. Water is the principle of which everything is built. And then, of course, with the different pre-Socratic philosophers, different elements become prominent. And Aximenes thinks it is air, because air is transparent, it has no qualities. Uh, if you compress air very tightly, you create metal or bone. If you take air and spread it out, you get fire. Everything made of air. Of course, uh, Lucippus and, and Democritus believe it is atoms the uncountable smallest particles. But uh, that's only one kind of pre-Socratic philosopher. Uh, the other one is the kind that talks about the aperon. And at least in English, we don't usually, we don't usually translate this. We leave it in Greek when we write about them in English. I don't know what you do in Spanish. Whether you leave it in Greek also? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, same. Same, yeah, same. The Greek word. This sort of boundless, formless, underlying thing from which all specific things emerge and all things pass back into them. So Anaximander thinks in the future all opposites will cancel each other. In the future we will have the aperon, which inspired Karl Marx, of course, this idea that the social classes and governments will gradually cancel each other. We end up with the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, in the case of uh, two pre-Socratic philosophers, namely Pythagoras and Anaxagoras, the aperon existed in the past and was destroyed. In the case of Anaxagoras, which is more famous, noose or mind began to think and the aperon began to spin very fast and breaks into pieces. In the case of Pythagoras, the aperon inhales. It breathes in the void or vacuum, and this breaks the aperon into pieces. And finally, you could say Parmenides. Although Parmenides doesn't use the term aperon, he uses being. It's the same idea. For Parmenides, the aperon exists now, not in the past or the future. It exists now. We simply don't 
notice it because we are deceived by the senses. Uh, if you follow the Logos, you will see that everything is one, according to the Parmenides. Everything is one and motionless. So these sorts of pre-Socratic theories are all undermining theories. Either they find one physical element, water or fire or air, as being at the bottom of everything, or they find the Aperon being at the bottom of everything. There is no pre-Socratic philosopher who would say that this bottle is real, that my chair is real, that the human body is real, that the sun is real. It's all made of something smaller. This is undermining. And we find it usually today in the sciences, although we also find it in some philosophers. So for example, in uh, a number of philosophers, today we find this idea that the whole is, is what comes first. There's a whole and it breaks into pieces. Uh, the young Emmanuel Levinas said this in his work, De l'existence à l'existence, which we call existence and existence in English, said that uh, there is simply il y a, the French for there is, there is simply being which is not broken into parts, and it's the human mind that breaks being into parts. This is the young Levinas. He's like a, a pre Socratic thinker. Even in Deleuze, there's this idea that the virtual isn't fully broken up into actual parts. In Simondon, Gilbert Simondon, who is becoming more and more popular in the United States, and probably here too, uh, as popular as Deleuze sometimes, Gilbert Simondon thinks we should not focus on individuals, we should focus on the process of individuation. Nothing is ever fully individuated. And also in uh, um, Jane Bennett, one of my favorite contemporary writers, in her book, Vibrant Matter, and in her, in her responses to me and Timothy Morton, she says that there is a single vibrant whole, and it occasionally breaks into temporary swirls, which we call things. But what is primary is this lively whole of which everything is made. Now, why doesn't this work? Why can't we agree with underminers? Why does object-oriented ontology say this is wrong? The main reason is because of what we call emergence. So consider the example of this university. Yes, this university needs lots of pieces. It needs all of you, it needs the buildings, it needs the whatever documents govern the university. And if all of them were to disappear, yes, the university would disappear. But think about it another way. Every year, some students leave, others come, some professors leave, others come. Maybe at some point in the future, the university will move to another part of Tijuana or even to another city. You never know. Our, my university in Egypt did this in 2008. It moved from downtown Cairo, Egypt, all the way to the desert. It was still the same university, even though all the buildings were different. Uh, so emergence is what happens when a new thing emerges that is more than its parts. And this is what the underminers cannot account for. How it is that the Autonomous University of Baja California remains the same university in some sense, even 100 years from now, when nobody is still here, and maybe the buildings are completely different in 100 years. You could still call it the same university in some sense. And so the parts do not have priority over the whole. Undermining is wrong. That's the first thing I wanted to say, that under undermining does not work. It uh, tries to go below objects, but it cannot explain that the objects are still there even when the pieces change. All right, now I want to put up a new word that does not exist in English. This is overminding. Actually, the word does exist in English, but it means something different. It means mining too much in one place and taking all the minerals out. You've done it too much. But that's not how I use it. I use it as the opposite of undermining, meaning that instead of saying objects are too shallow, we go below objects to get the tiny pieces. You say objects are too deep. Whoever saw these objects, all we ever see are events, or we see images in our minds, or we, all we encounter is language, or all we encounter is a power struggle and objects are a derivative of the power struggle. Uh, or just about any modern, almost any modern idea 
is an overlying idea. This idea that objects are not too, too shallow and we go below, they're too deep, we go above. Starting with uh, Descartes, but certainly in Kant. This idea that we cannot get at the thing in itself, we're talking only about appearances, the transcendental structure of appearances, of the phenomena. There's no talking about an object. At least Kant agrees that there is a thing in itself there, but he, he doesn't say much about it in his philosophy. Or consider my favorite living philosopher, Bruno Latour. Some people think of him more as an anthropologist or sociologist. Latour is one of the founders of actor network theory. Actor network theory says if you want to know what a thing is, look at what it does. A thing is its actions, nothing more. And so what am I? I am the person giving this lecture in Tawana right now. That's all I am. And whatever other things I'm doing, my heart is beating, um, my money is earning small amounts of interest in the bank as I speak. All the other things I am doing, combine those all, all of my actions, that is what I am. I am an actor, according to Bernard Latour. All right, well, what is the problem with these theories? These theories cannot explain change. And Aristotle noticed this a long time ago. If you've recently read Aristotle's Metaphysics, there's a place where he is critiquing the Megarian philosophers who come from Megara, close to Athens, to the west of Athens. The Megarians thought, you're not a house builder unless you are building a house right now. Everything is only what it actually is. And so if I'm a master house builder and I'm sleeping, I'm not a house builder. If I'm a master house builder eating lunch, I'm not a house builder. I have to be building the house right now. Now you may remember Aristotle said this is absurd because obviously a master house builder is asleep, is more of a house builder than I am, even if I'm trying to build the house and failing. This is what led Aristotle to introduce his concept of dunamis, or potentiality. A uh, thing is more than what it's currently doing. And there may be some problems with the concept of potentiality, but uh, he's on the right track there. There needs to be a surplus in things, a reality that is not always expressed. So, for example, I can speak German, but I'm not going to speak any German in this lecture. I'm still a German speaker. Uh, I can speak a little French. I'm not going to speak any French in this. I, I spoke a few words in French, but I'm not going to speak very much French. Doesn't matter. Uh, I'm still, you can still call me a German speaker or a French speaker, even if I'm not speaking those languages at all today. Aristotle would call it potential. All right, so. Overmining is the idea that you don't need this idea of objects. You only need to look at actions, events, appearances, and be suspicious of anything that's hiding underneath. And you find this in most modern and postmodern thinkers, whether it's Derrida, Husserl, Bruno Latour, um, Alfred North Whitehead, another philosopher I like, similar to Latour, he thinks the relations between things are what is real. So we have undermining and overmining. Now, what usually happens is that the two of them combine together to destroy objects. And I had to invent what I thought was a completely new word. I remember where I was. I was in Brazil. I was in a hotel in Sao Paulo, and I said, I need a word to cover cases where people do undermining and overmining simultaneously. And so, of course, I thought of dual mining first as the obvious, uh, obvious suggestion for that. And so I immediately searched for dual mining on Google, because actually I don't like inventing new words. It always seems artificial. Uh, I like to use words that already exist, even if they were rare, and put them to new use. And as it turned out, I was happy dual mining already exists. It is used by credit cards. Uh, dual mining means text mining and data mining you to find out as much information about you as possible. And it's actually pretty scary what they can do. I read once that credit card companies can predict three years in advance with 80% accuracy, will you get divorced? I don't know how they do it, but something about changes in spending habits predicts a divorce. You might not even think you're going to get a divorce, but the credit card companies have a good idea that you will. 
So they are very effective in this sinister way, uh, undermining and overmining. They call it dual money. And so I like that. I like this idea that it's already out there and it's already a negative word for the invasion of privacy. In a way, dual mining in philosophy is also invading the privacy of the object. It's reducing the object to its pieces or reducing an object to its effects. Now, what else is left? Some people might say that's all you can do. These are the two forms of knowledge. If somebody asks you what something is, like if I hold this up and I said, what is this? There are two kinds of answers you can give. There are only two kinds of knowledge available to humans. You can tell me what this is made of. You can say it's a plastic thing with ink inside, or you can tell me what it does. It's used for writing on the board. I've thought about this for years, and I think there is no other kind of knowledge. Knowledge is either saying what a thing is made of or saying what it does. It's either undermining or overmining. And that's fine. We need knowledge to survive. We need this for medicine. We need this for engineering. We need this for economics. Um, we need to know how, what things are made of and what they do. So it's not, we're not trying to eliminate knowledge. We are simply saying that knowledge is not the whole of cognition. There is another kind of cognition that is not a knowledge. It doesn't involve telling what a thing is made of or what it does. Do I have any examples of this? Yes, I have two very good examples. Let's start with philosophy itself. Is philosophy really a kind of knowledge? I say no. I say the idea that philosophy is a kind of knowledge is a modern uh, mistake inspired by the great success of the mathematical natural sciences, which are a kind of knowledge. That by overmining material reality, as Descartes and Galileo started to do, by expressing its movement in terms of mathematical equations, formalizing the movement of things, that's probably the most important thing that's happening in human history. It has opened up a whole scientific and technological revolution. And so philosophy has felt somewhat inferior to this and has tried to become a kind of knowledge in its own right. If the sciences can be knowledge, philosophy should be scientific. I mean, there are many analytic philosophers who think this way. Even in continental philosophy, however, there are people like Badiou, Badiou who think, Alain Badiou who thinks of uh, philosophy as, uh, ontology is purely mathematical. Or Quentin Meassou, I think some of you are reading, uh, who's my own age. Meassou thinks the primary qualities of things are the ones that can be mathematically determined. There's a problem with this, though. Don't forget Socrates, who I would call the first Western philosopher. Socrates is most famous for saying the only thing he knows is he knows nothing. He's never been anyone's teacher. And other sayings of this kind. If you read any Platonic dialogue, you will never gain knowledge about anything. You don't find out what virtue is, what friendship is, what love is, what beauty is. All of the answers people give to these in Plato's dialogues are undermined, let's say. They are, they are destroyed. None of the definitions work. There is not one dialogue of Plato where at the end Socrates gives a valid definition. He gets closer to it. And, of course, we know the word philosophia. Even the etymology of the words, philosophy is about the love of wisdom. It's not about a claim to have any knowledge, the way the sciences and mathematics can claim to have knowledge or even the way that social sciences can claim to have knowledge by mathematizing our understanding of politics or of economic data. Economics, of course, a uh, very mathematical discipline is a sort of overmining, and that's great. It gives us knowledge about how the economy works. Philosophy doesn't really give us knowledge about anything. It gives us a love of wisdom. And not just Socrates, of course, but also uh, in Nicholas of Cusa, at the very beginning of modern philosophy, Learned ignorance, thought to ignorantia, is this idea of, not, of knowing without knowing. In Plato's Mino, there is the famous case of Mino's paradox, as we call it in English at least. Mino's paradox is the idea that you cannot look for something if you have it, and you cannot look for it if you don't have it. Because if I already have, let's say, courage, I don't need to look for it because I already have it. 
But if I don't know what it is already, I won't know it when I find it. And so it's a, it's a paradox created by the sophists to say there's no point looking for anything. But these are two extreme possibilities, and they both miss the third possibility in the middle, which is philosophia. You have some idea of what courage is, but you don't yet know exactly what it is. And this is why you search. So I would uh, criticize the usual attempt to link philosophy with any form of knowledge, whether it be mathematics, the natural sciences, or anything else. On the grounds that Socrates did the same. And so I'm simply going back to ask what was the original sense of philosophia in Socrates? Now, some people will say this is nonsense because you'll end up with nothing but negative theology. You might remember negative theology in such figures as Pseudo Dionysius is about saying what God is not. You cannot say what he is. God is too great to be described in positive terms. So you can only say God has no body. God has no intelligence in the human sense because he's above that. God has no spatial location. You narrow it down by saying what God is not. But in fact, those are again not the only possibilities. Our statements are not just positive or negative. We say things indirectly, elusively, in the form of innuendo, in the form of hints. This is a large part of our communication with each other. We hint at things without saying them explicitly. Aristotle again, in the rhetoric, he says this is what rhetoric is about. Right? Rhetoric is about the enthymeme, if you remember this term. The enthymeme is something you don't have to say because it's left implied in what you're saying. So let's say I'm in ancient Greece, and I'm saying this man, Professor Philippe Lee, has been three times crowned with laurel. What does that mean in ancient Greece? It means he has won the Olympics three times. But all Greeks know that the man who wins the Olympics gains a crown of laurel leaves. So I don't have to say it. And it's more powerful to leave it implied than to say it outright. What's the best example of this? You've probably all seen the movie The Godfather. It's a great movie about the mafia in New York. And this great phrase, I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. What does that mean? Well, we know it means something very bad. What does he actually do in the, in the film, the first, at the very beginning? He wants the Hollywood director to give his friend the parts in the movie. And the, man, the director says no. And so he has a beautiful racehorse. He cuts off the racehorse's head and puts it in his bed. And he wakes up and there's blood all over the bed and the horse's head is there. What if instead of saying, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse, he said, I'm going to cut off your horse's head and put it in your bed at night. It's disgusting, but it's not frightening the way hinting is frightening. Hints are always scarier. Uh, there was a terrible example from Dick Cheney that I just learned about. When Dick Cheney was the uh, Secretary of Defense back in 1991 under the first President Bush, this was at the time of the first Iraq War. And there were rumors going around that Saddam Hussein is going to use chemical weapons against the American soldiers. And Dick Cheney wanted to scare the Iraqis not to do that. And so what did he say to Saddam? He sent a letter to Saddam Hussein. What did it say? Something terrible, but something that is a very effective threat. He said, if Iraq uses chemical weapons against American soldiers, the United States will respond promptly and decisively in a manner from which it will take Iraq centuries to recover. Which is a it's an inhumane thing to say, but it's much better as a threat than saying, if you use chemical weapons, we will use nuclear weapons. Because then you're giving it away. You're saying in explicit propositional terms what we will do. And that's always less scary, no matter what it is, than a very vague, unstated threat. What about jokes? If you want to ruin a joke, simply state it in literal terms. Um, I, I have a rotating list of examples I use. Which one should I use today? Um, I'll use the joke today about Chinatown in San Francisco. A man goes into a shop in Chinatown and he's looking at all the items and he finds a, a rat made of brass and he says, how much does this rat cost? And the owner of the shop says, $10 for the rat, but $10,000 for the story behind the rat. And he said, I'll just pay the $10. So he buys the rat and he walks out of the store and rats start following him. And so he starts running, looking behind him. There's hundreds of rats, thousands of rats, all chasing him. 
and he's running faster and faster, but there's more rats coming from the sewer, and finally there, there are close to a million rats. And so he climbs up the telephone pole next to the water, and the rats start chewing up the pole and chasing him. And so he takes the rat and throws it in the water, and all of the rats jump in and drown. And so he goes back to the store, and the store owner says, smiling, and says, I think you want to buy that story now, right? For $10,000. And he says, no, I just want to know if you have any brass lawyers. <laughs> okay, now let's say you're telling that joke and there's a child here. The child doesn't understand the joke. You have to explain it to them. You say, well, people don't like lawyers because they think lawyers take too much money and they entangle you in all kinds of complications. And so the man didn't even care about knowing why the, why the rat was being chased by the real rats. He just wants to kill all the lawyers he knows. Also, imagine you want to ruin the joke I thought of three ways you could ruin this joke. One way is to give the joke a backstory, explain the story. Start the joke by saying, a man in San Francisco was in a really bitter divorce, and his wife hired a really mean lawyer, and that lawyer took away all his money. And then he walks into the store. That's stupid now, right? Because then it's just kind of silly revenge. He's mad that his wife got all his money from this lawyer. So it's not funny anymore. It's only funny when it's sudden, and there's no reason for it. Okay, or let's say it, the joke ends with the man saying, yes, I do have a brass lawyer. And he sells him a brass lawyer for $10. And he walks out and all the lawyers start chasing him. And he starts running and more and more lawyers are chasing him. And he climbs up the pole, the lawyers are chasing him, and he throws it in and it drops. That's silly. That would ruin the joke. The final way you can ruin the joke is that the man comes back into the store and, he, and the shopkeeper says, I think you want to buy that story for $10,000 now. And he, says, no, I just want to know if you have any brass carpenters. Why? Because nobody, nobody hates carpenters as far as I know, right? Um, it's not funny. Okay. So in, all, in order to be a funny joke, and it's not that funny, but it's a little bit funny, everything has to be said without explanation. You have to leave a lot of things in the joke that aren't explained. Or magic tricks. You go to see a magician. You're doing all these tricks. And at the end, you go up and, I demand to know how you did all those tricks. I demand. I know their tricks. Tell me how you did them all. What I didn't know is that magicians around the world have an agreement with each other never to share the tricks with people outside. Because obviously the excitement of watching a magician is seeing these tricks happen for no reason. So it's not about negative theology, it's about hinting. It's about speaking in a kind of language that is not just clear propositions about the truth but statements that hint at what the reality is. And as I mentioned, a lot of our communication is already about this. Metaphor being a good example. It's well known that you cannot take a metaphor and explain it in prose terms. Just like you cannot take a globe of the world and flatten it to two dimensions on a map. It's mathematically impossible. So too, you cannot take a metaphor and put it in literal terms. So imagine Homer in the Iliad of the Odyssey Homer talks a lot about the wine dark sea. What does that mean? Well, you could say wine dark sea means the Mediterranean Sea is dark just like wine and it's the same color if you compare them. Now that's stupid. That's not what the metaphor is saying. The metaphor is saying more than that. The metaphor is also trying to say that the sea is dangerous like wine, it's intoxicating like wine. You can never exactly say in prose what the metaphor means. Literary critics have known this for 60 or 70 years. What about a literary work itself, or what about a painting? Again, you cannot explain those in literal terms. Art. No artwork can be replaced by a description of the artwork. Imagine reading a book about, let's say, Picasso or Cezanne, and there were no illustrations. It was just somebody trying to explain what each of the paintings looks like. Uh, there would be something wrong. You would not learn enough from that artwork. You need to actually see the painting for yourself, see the sculpture for yourself, see the installation art for yourself. It cannot be replaced by prose. And this is what reality is like. Reality cannot be replaced by a set of descriptions. So art and philosophy are together in this way, as is architecture and some other disciplines, which are not primarily producing knowledge. Yes, you could learn something from a painting, you could learn something from a building, you could learn something from a philosopher, but it's not primarily knowledge that they're producing. 
This is obvious in the case of an artist, right? An artist is producing works. They're not producing knowledge about those works. Usually, the better an artwork is, the more different interpretations it can have. So, um, picture some of the greatest masterpieces of Cubism, whether it's Picasso or Rock. Uh, the, the greater they are, the more different interpretations scholars can have of them. Or let's say Shakespeare, or let's say Don Quixote. All of these works are interpreted again and again because they're among the greatest, which means it is harder to explain them in prose terms. What the critic does, the critic does not provide knowledge, the critic tries to hint at what is behind the knowledge they're producing. Isn't food criticism like this? Isn't theater criticism like this? And my favorite example, wine criticism. You all probably know about Daniel Dennett, who is one of the most reductive philosophers in America. Uh, I, love, I love and hate this essay he has called Coining Quelia, where in this essay, Dennett is making fun of wine tasters. He imagines a wine taster, or Coca-Cola taster. <laughs> By the way, we say in the States, the Coca-Cola is better in Mexico, and I think it is. <laughs> right, because you use, I think you use sugar instead of corn syrup. And maybe the formula is the original formula. I like this is better. I'm glad I got it. <laughs> That's why I wanted to try it. Um, say you drink the wine and you say, flamboyant and velvety pinot, but lacking in stamina. That's the example Tennant makes fun of. He says, this is ridiculous. You want to know what wine is? You take the wine, you pour it in a machine, and the machine gives the chemical formula. That is scientific wine tasting. Now, we know this is undermining in, in my you're just replacing the taste of the wine with the chemical formula for the wine. It's also possible to have an overmining wine criticism, where you say, this, this wine makes me feel happy. This wine makes me feel free. All you're doing then is reducing the wine to its subjective effect on you. The wine critic, the professional wine critic, is trying to give you something more objective than that, not just how it makes them feel. But they're also not undermining it. They're not giving a chemical formula. They are flamboyant and velvety, lacking in stamina. These are poetic terms. And yes, some wine tasters are pretentious and silly, but some of them are very good, just like some literary critics are very good, even if others are pretentious and silly. And so we learn which, which critics to respect in each area the most. Um, and we can also improve our own taste. You can take a wine tasting course and learn how to taste better, or beer tasting, or food tasting. I'm improving my taste as, a, as an architectural critic. I, I came to architecture school knowing nothing about architecture. I've had to learn. And I'm getting better every year. More objective in my taste for which buildings are, are better than others. At first it was just sort of random. Which ones make me feel better? Now I'm getting better at it. So this is an example of why object-oriented ontology sees aesthetics as much more important in philosophy than most philosophers think. We would put aesthetics at the center. Why? Because aesthetics is not about putting things in prose language. It's even Kant in the Critique of Judgment talks about how you cannot explain beauty using concepts. It's about taste. And we agree with Kant on that. That there's no way to put things directly in prose terms. And this is why aesthetics is the center of philosophy. And I'll say more about this in a minute. All right, so that's the end of my first part. I can even speed up a little now, maybe. Am I talking at the right speed? Or too fast? It's good? It's good? Okay, thank you. Now I said before that most Western philosophy and most Western thoughts either undermines or overmines or dual minds. Most philosophy is anti-object-oriented. It tries to destroy the object and give us its parts, or it tries to destroy the object and give us its effects. Not all philosophy is like this. I can think of at least four traditions in the history of philosophy that have respected objects, but not enough to satisfy me. The first, of course, of these traditions is Aristotle's tradition of substances, primary substances. Unlike Plato, Aristotle can be said to put individual things, individual substances, at the basis of his philosophy. 
However, in Aristotle's tradition, it's usually a matter of natural things, not artificial things. And you can see this in Leibniz, who's Aristotle's maybe most important modern follower, where he distinguishes between substance and aggregates. And so for Leibniz, a flower can be a substance, but not a circle of men holding hands. If everybody in this room holds hands in a circle, that's just an aggregate. Each of us is an individual person, but all the people together in a circle is not a, is not a substance. There's no monad. He says one diamond is a substance, but two diamonds glued together is not a substance. Now that's a strange one, because one diamond is not really found in nature. It's very ugly in nature. You have to cut it and polish it, and so it's already very artificial. And then my favorite example, uh, Professor Philippe Lee held up my book in materialism, because Leibniz also makes fun of the Dutch East India Company, right? Because the Dutch East India Company is a big, it's the first corporation. It has many ships, many workers, many islands that it owns. Um, it, it did a lot of different things, caused a lot of events. But Leibniz doesn't think it can be one thing. I tried to show in my book in materialism why the Dutch East India Company is one thing. So, uh, that tradition cannot really explain airplanes or computers or any of those as one thing, because they are aggregates. Um, or what about NAFTA, which is in the news a lot? NAFTA, I would say, is one thing. It's made of three countries. It's still one thing, because that one thing has effects on all three of the countries. They have to respond to it in different ways. Um, so, or the European Union. These can also be single objects for me, even though they have parts. Just like um, this ring is one thing, even though it has many parts of metal in it. So that's the first tradition in philosophy that, that respects objects. And I've said why Aristotle's tradition is great, but it uh, cannot tell us enough about compounds, entities with lots of parts, or artificial entity. The next tradition, of course, is Immanuel Kant with his thing in itself, the Ding an sich, that can be thought but not known. It's amazing how unpopular Kant's thing in itself has become. I can only think of a handful of philosophers since Kant who have defended it. Schopenhauer defends it, Heidegger in one passage defends it, but most of the time people are saying, oh, that was Kant's most stupid idea. Right? All the German idealists say this, Nietzsche says this. They think this is his leftover Platonism, his leftover Christianity, they don't take it seriously. I, I take it very seriously. I think, I happen to think Kant is right about the thing in itself, as I will say in a moment. But what's wrong with Kant's tradition? What's wrong with Kant's tradition of the thing in itself is that it's always a thing in itself for humans. It's that we poor human beings are so finite that we cannot reach the thing in itself. What about objects touching each other? The example I often use from Islamic philosophy, which I taught in Cairo, is fire burning cotton. Islamic philosophers love this example in the Middle Ages. Fire is burning cotton. Some of them say, actually, no, God is burning the cotton. The fire is just the occasion for God to burn the cotton. This is the first occasionalism, centuries before the French occasionalism of Malroche. So what about when one object touches another? I say there's a thing in itself there as well, the fire does not touch all the qualities of the cotton. Right? The fire only touches some features of the cotton. It's flammability. The fire has no idea of the whiteness of the cotton, the softness of the cotton, the price of the cotton. The fire and the cotton are just as finite as we humans are. Finitude has nothing to do with human consciousness. Simply to be an object is to be finite and to enter into relation is always to translate the thing you are relating to. You'll never, you'll never touch anything directly. Okay, the third tradition. The third tradition that enjoys objects starts with Alfred North Whitehead and continues today in Bruno Latour, among others. Uh, in this tradition of Whitehead, process and reality, the world is made of actual entities, he says, but they are defined by their relations to other entities. So here I am, as an entity, I am defined by my relations to all of you, and to the table, and to my parents, and to all of this. So every second my relations change, I'm actually a new person. It just seems like I'm the same person. Actually, I'm a different one. 
This is why Bruno Latour calls uh, uh, objects actors, because it's their actions, their relations to other things. And the, again, I said the problem with this tradition is it's an overmining tradition. You cannot explain change if you think a thing is only its relations and only its actions. Okay, I have a certain relation to all of you, but four days from now I'll be teaching my students in Los Angeles and I'll have a very different relation to all of you. I might be in your memories, I might not. Instead, I'll be standing in front of the architecture students in Los Angeles. So my relations are changing, but four days from now I will be the same person, more or less, despite some changes in my relations. We could say it's the, it's the same person. Finally, the tradition of phenomenology, which is the one I use most. It is not realized that this is a great object-oriented tradition, a very great one. And in fact, object-oriented ontology develops from phenomenology in both Husserl's sense and Heidegger's sense. And this is going to be the second part of the lecture. I'm trying to time it just right. Well, let me start with Heidegger. Because my philosophy began when I was a graduate student. I was writing my doctoral thesis on the famous tool analysis in being in time, which everybody knows. It's a famous analysis. And if you think of the tool analysis in Heidegger as coming against the background of Husserl's phenomenology, Husserl thinks the way to do philosophy is to focus on appearances, focus on phenomena, and describe exactly in great detail what you experience. Don't invent scientific theories or other theories about what you see. Simply describe the phenomena very accurately and try to determine the essence of everything you experience. Of course, Heidegger's objection to this from a surprisingly young age was that most of the things we deal with in the world are not in our conscious minds. A good example being the floor of this room. Nobody was thinking of the floor until I mentioned it just now, probably, right? None of you. But you needed it. You were taking the floor for granted. If the floor disappears, you fall. You're injured or killed. Falling into the, if there's a basement here, I don't know, but if there is, you fall to the basement of this building. Or if there's an earthquake, then you notice the floor because it's shaking. Or if the floor is sticky, and you feel that it's sticky, you can't move your shoes, maybe you notice the floor. Most of the time you are not. <clears throat> you were probably not thinking about the air in this room until I mentioned it. Unless you're having a hard time breathing, you're not thinking of the air. You probably were not thinking of your heartbeats right now, unless you have a medical condition and you're worried about your heart. You just rely on your heart to beat. You don't think about it. So, for Heidegger, what's most important are these things in the background, these invisible things that usually we only notice when they go wrong, when we're hammering and the hammer breaks or the hammer is too heavy or I'm getting a blister and it's hurting, my, hurting me to hammer, then we notice the hammer. Most of the time, however, the hammer is, is invisible. We're thinking about what we build with it. We're thinking about the house, what we plan to do in the house. So this is just a basic summary of Heidegger's major objection to Husserl's phenomenology. We'll, we'll return to Husserl in a few minutes. We're on Heidegger now. And in my dissertation, this was back in 1992, that I started, it took me years to finish it, but I was starting it in about 1992. And I thought, okay, I'm going to write a dissertation for my doctoral thesis that shows that the tool analysis explains all of Heidegger's philosophy. I still think it does. But all of his concepts have to be explained in terms of this tool analysis. And this is already going to be radical. Heidegger scholars don't like it, even now in 2018. I thought this will be a good dissertation. It will be a little controversial. But then I started working on it and found some more strange things. Here's one of the strange things I discovered. Very often, people interpret Heidegger's tool analysis to say that there is this big opposition between theory and practice. Right, that before you can look at anything or make a theory about it, you have to be using it unconsciously. After a few years, I noticed there's a problem with that. The problem with that is that practice is not really a closer relationship to things than theory. So to give an example, 
my wife is a food scientist, and so she can analyze this Coca-Cola. She can put it in a machine. She can tell me things about this. What it's made of, what its health properties are. That's a theoretical understanding of the Coca-Cola. I know nothing about food science, so I just drink it. I use it. I have a practical relation to the Coca-Cola. I drink it, I enjoy it, it satisfies my thirst. So, according to that interpretation of Heidegger, we have to be enjoying the Coca-Cola before we understand it. Yes, but using the Coca-Cola as a drink is not really any closer to the cola than studying it is. Because what happens? In the case of Heidegger complains about theoretical understanding, that any theoretical knowledge of the cola distorts it or translates it away from its original form. Coca-Cola, there's a being to the Coca-Cola is for everything, and it withdraws into darkness. It is veiled, it is concealed. This is kind of a trivial example, but you can imagine an example of a Greek temple or something else. It's always hidden or concealed. But when I use the Coca-Cola, isn't the same thing happening? It's also concealed. I have human taste, I don't have dog taste or mosquito taste. And so I'm humanizing the Coca-Cola when I drink it. Even though I'm not thinking about it or studying it, I'm still humanizing it. I'm reducing it to human terms by tasting it. So what it seemed to me at that point is that Heidegger is really showing us that there are objects deeper than any human contact, whether it's practical, theoretical, or anything. Every human relation to an object translates it into something different. And I was there for a while. I stayed there for a while. And I think I could persuade Heidegger of that if he were alive. The theory versus praxis is not really a very deep distinction. It looks like it is. And a lot of philosophy is based on this distinction today. But it's not really a very deep distinction. Theory and praxis are both human relations to the world. The difference between conscious and unconscious is not that important for ontology. It might be important for psychology, but not, not for philosophy. And then after a few more years, I took a much more unusual step, which is to realize, hey, objects do this to each other also. And that's when people started saying this is crazy, right? because modern philosophy is based on the idea that you cannot talk about the relation between objects, except insofar as it manifests to humans in science, for example. So in Kant's philosophy, for example, I cannot talk about fire burning cotton. I can only talk about humans observing fire burning cotton. I can't know what it's like when fire in itself burns cotton in itself. I think this is wrong. I think this is where philosophy after Kant took a wrong turn. I think the history of philosophy has crossroads where things can go this way or that. And I think the period right after Kant is one of the great crossroads. And let me explain why. What was the, the usual, uh, sorry, the usual critique of Kant in his lifetime and after? It was that of the German idealists. It was that of Fichte and Hegel and some other figures such as Solomon Maimon. We're trying to say that Kant is a great genius, but where did he get this silly idea about things in themselves? Because of course, if I say there was a thing outside thoughts, well, I'm thinking about it when I say it, so I'm contradicting myself. I cannot say there's a thing outside thoughts because I'm using thought to say it, and therefore I'm trapped in this circle. And this is the road to German idealism, and to most philosophy in the West since then. This idea that you cannot gain any access to a thing in itself out there. As mentioned, there are only a hand, tiny handful of philosophers who defend the thing in itself. Almost everyone agrees that it's a terrible idea, and I don't. I think it's a good idea. That is one side of Kant's. That is the side of Kant that German idealism radicalized and said there's no thing in itself. But there's another way, another thing that could have happened. Instead of saying Kant was a great philosopher except for this stupid ding on Zeker thing in itself, we could have said Kant is a great philosopher precisely because of the thing in itself. But why did he limit it to, why did he limit it to human beings? Why do we not say that when fire burns cotton, the cotton is a thing in itself for the fire, the fire only touches some of the qualities? This actually would have been much more revolutionary. We could have had German realism instead of German idealism. And it was possible because, remember, the influence of Leibniz. 
And Leibniz had this seemingly crazy theory in which all kinds of monads affect each other. That could have been a possible path in history. And if that had happened, civilization would be very different today. <clears throat> there would have been no Marxism, for example, because there would have been no Hegel to be radicalized by Marx. There would have been no Nietzsche in the way we know him. There would have been no pragmatism. There would have been no other idealist philosophies of the 20th century. Instead, we'd still be in this post-Kantian realism that doesn't exist, instead of a post-Kantian idealism that does exist. In a way, object-oriented ontology is simply German realism happening 200 years later than it should have, except it's not German anymore. Uh, it's mostly in the United States. But in a way, we're just taking the other road that was not taken after Kant's. So what do we have in Heidegger? What do we have in Heidegger when the tool breaks? Well, I'm going to put this on the board. step. This diagram is going to be much more full by the time I'm finished in 20 minutes or so. We have the hammer. You're working with the hammer and suddenly it breaks. But what happens in that case? Well, it's not that the hammer suddenly becomes deeply visible to you. The being of the hammer is still hidden from you. What happens is that certain qualities of the hammer become noticed that you didn't notice before. You're thinking of the hammer, you're thinking of certain qualities of the hammer. That it's made of wood, the wood is giving you a blister, it's heavy, it's too heavy, so you have to stop hammering. And these things are pointing towards a hammer that you cannot see, a kind of essence of the hammer or being of the hammer that is always hidden, whether it's broken or not. The hammer I call a real object because it's an object, it's a unified thing. It's real because it's there whether we like it to be there or not. But it's also withdrawn in Heidegger's sense. It's veiled, it's hidden, it's concealed. This is Heidegger's major idea, of course. The idea that being always hides behind the appearances. Then you have the qualities of the hammer which are visible. I call them the sensual qualities because the senses can make contact with them. They're not hidden the way the hammer itself is. I, I can describe them and so forth. This, I say, is the diagonal line that also happens in the case of artworks. Um, let me put up a metaphor again as an example, the same one I used. Dark Sea is the one that Homer uses again and again, especially in the Odyssey when Odysseus is trying to get home. At the bottom, I made up a metaphor. It's the opposite. Sea Dark Wine. Sea Dark Wine is also a metaphor. Homer never uses it. And this shows why metaphors are not reversible. Right? Wine Dark Sea and Sea Dark Wine are not the same metaphor. The first one is about the sea. It has wine qualities. The second one is about the wine. It has sea qualities. What this means is that metaphorical language, unlike literal language, is broken in half. Um, so if I were to say a pen is like a pencil, that's boring, right? It's not a metaphor, it's a literal statement. I could also say a pencil is like a pen. It means the same thing. Any literal statement can be reversed, and it means exactly the same as it meant in its original form. Why? Because in a literal statement, you are simply comparing the qualities of things and saying they are the same. 
pen is like a pencil or a pencil is like a pen, you can write with both of them, it doesn't matter. But wine dark sea and sea dark wine are not reversible. They're two different metaphors. What this means is that the metaphor has two sides. One of them is the subject term and one of them is the qualities term. In the case of wine dark sea, what happens is the C is up there on the upper left hand corner. The C is the real object you're talking about and it has wine qualities and it naturally repels those qualities because a C has C qualities in the real language. It doesn't have wine qualities. So what you get in the case of the metaphor is you get the C up there and the wine qualities down here. So this is what art does. Art gives you an object that cannot be explained in literal terms or in prose terms. Um, even Marcel Duchamp's famous urinal, which looks like a liberal object, becomes a non-liberal object as soon as it's put in the art gallery. <laughs> so it's not an artwork unless it somehow hides or withdraws from view. All right. So let me finish now with Rousseau, because we, we, we were too quick in accepting Heidegger's criticism of Rousseau. There's also something in Rousseau going on that I think is unprecedented in the history of philosophy, and Heidegger pretty much misses it most of the time. What does Husserl ask us to do when he asks us to look at appearances? Well, he's no realist. Husserl doesn't. Husserl says the idea of a thing in itself is absurd. So he disagrees with Heidegger. Husserl says every object is potentially the object of consciousness. But he discovers something within appearance. Change it now to Coke bottles. What did David Hume think about objects in the world of the senses? Well, he thought that objects didn't really exist. British empiricism, not just Hume, but all of the empiricists, tend to think that I just see some qualities here. I see red and I see this brown liquid. I don't really see an object called Coca-Cola bottle. I just see all the different qualities, and I put them together with a nickname, Coca-Cola bottle. But all I really see are qualities. Just like the theory of names of Bertrand Russell claims that the name Harmon is simply an abbreviation for all the true facts about me. It's the British tradition of treating things as bundles of qualities sets of qualities. Well, Husserl completely turns this on its head. Husserl, in all phenomenology, say the object comes first. Why? Because look at this bottle. I turn it, and I'm seeing different qualities every second. But it's always the same bottle. The qualities I see every second are the abschattungen, the adumbrations, we call them in English. I don't know the Spanish term. Uh, the different sides of the bottle you're seeing as you turn it, or the different distances I hold. For Rousseau, it's one and the same bottle. And so he, he discovers something that Hume had suppressed in his theory of perception. Rousseau discovered perception is made of objects, not just qualities. And those objects stay the same. No matter how they, no matter what side I see them from, no matter how much light is shining on it, no matter what kind of good or bad mood I'm in when I see the bottle, the object remains the same. And so you have a tension in Husserl between the central object, because he's, he doesn't believe in the thing in itself. He thinks this object is seen by me. It's not hiding. But then you also have the qualities. So you have this tension there. These two are holding together. That's the first step. Now, there's another weird thing going on in Husserl, however. What does Husserl want you to do? If you're doing a 
phenomenological analysis of this Coca-Cola bottle, you're supposed to find the essence of it, right? So let's say, is the label essential? No, because I can tear it off, right? I won't try it now, but I can, I can tear off the label directly. Does it have to be full to be a Coca-Cola bottle? No, because I can have it all the way down or even gone. And by going this way, you will eventually come to the essence of the Coca-Cola bottle that it needs. So if I, if I put this in a shredder and put it into a million pieces, then it's obviously not a Coca-Cola bottle. So it needs some kind of physical integrity. It needs a certain shape. It should have Coca-Cola in it instead of lemonade. It should have this label on it, this cap on it. But this is a different kind of quality. Now, Husserl thinks you, these are perceived with your senses on the bottom, and these are perceived with your minds. I think that's impossible, because anything that's real, anything which is in itself, is not graspable by the mind any more than by the senses. Again, the difference between theory, cognition, and sensation is not an important difference for object-oriented ontology. Just like the difference between theory and practice is not an important uh, difference for object-oriented ontology. So, let me draw that crossing X a little better. One second. relations here that involve a tension between one kind of object and its qualities. The idea is that an object both has and does not have its qualities, right? Because again, yes, you can say this has a label, but if I tear off the label and throw it away, it's still a Coke bottle. It just doesn't have the quality of the label. And so does having a label belong to a Coke bottle or not? Well, yes and no. It both does and doesn't have it. Just like being a philosophy professor both belongs to me and, and doesn't belong to me. I might, maybe I get fired, maybe I quit and do something else next year. In one sense, it's important to who I am to be a philosophy professor. In another, it could change. Objects both have and do not have their own qualities. That is one of the um, central principles of object-oriented ontology. And as you'll see tomorrow, our method in most fields involves trying to drive a wedge between objects and their qualities. See what happens. And so, for example, in the book about the Dutch East India Company, I tried to imagine which things were important, which things were unimportant uh, for the company to continue to be what it was. And I'm gonna talk about that book tomorrow. But I just wanna point out that there's one more line missing. You probably see it. Do real objects have a tense relation with their own qualities? The answer is yes. We get this from Leibniz in the monadology. There's a passage right at the beginning of the monadology where Leibniz says, on the one hand, every monad is one. It's a unified thing. But on the other hand, every monad must have its own multiplicity of qualities, otherwise things would all be alike. Everything would just be a one, and a snowflake would be the same as a Coke bottle, would be the same as a flower, would be the same as a Anything, anything for him. So we do have to add that fourth line. So we have four lines. It's a fourfold of our own. It's not that different from Heidegger's fourfold, I've tried to say. Um, four tensions, because there are two kinds of objects and two kinds of qualities. Every object has both real qualities and sensual qualities, and it both has them and does not have them. An object has a very loose relation with its own qualities. That's why metaphors can be done, which take qualities away from one object and put them on another. That's why causal relations can happen, which take qualities from one object and translate them to another. And anytime there's a tension between 
objects and their qualities. The term we use for that is aesthetics. Aesthetics is not just about art, it's the study of the troubled relation between objects and their own qualities. And this is why we say aesthetics is first philosophy. Aesthetics is at the center of philosophy. It doesn't just mean art is, is the center of all philosophy, although I do rate art very highly. It's about the fact that aesthetics allows us to explore the difficult relations that objects have between themselves and with their own qualities. And I just want to make two more points before I stop. One of them is that since we accept Heidegger's principle, or even Kant's principle, that the real thing is withdrawn from any contact, it becomes a problem how things relate. How can things relate if they're withdrawn from each other? And so we use this term vicarious causation, which means something similar to occasional cause in the tradition, except there's a big difference. In the tradition, occasionalism was a religious philosophy. It meant that nothing can relate unless God comes and burns the cotton, or God, when I think I'm picking this up, but actually God is picking it up for me. This actually goes way back to early Islam before it comes in through France. Uh, into Western philosophy. The problem with that theory is not that God is in it and we should all try to get God out of philosophy and so forth. No, the problem with it is that it chooses anything as an exception. If nothing can touch anything else, why should God be able to do it? Well, in a way, Kant and Hume are doing the same thing as the occasionalists, except instead of saying that all causality is in God, they're saying all causality is in the human mind. In Hume's case, causation is a habit that we form through customary conjunction. In Kant's case, causation is, is one of the categories of the understanding that humans are imposing on the world. Um, and we are saying neither God nor the human mind can be an exception. Everything has problems making relations with anything else. And so all causation is indirect. All causation between objects passes through a third term, which is qualities that they share. All causation between qualities happens through objects. I won't go further into that today, but we, we draw the consequence uh, for a new way of trying to understand causation. The last point I want to make is that we have terms for these four lines. One at the bottom is called time, because what, what really happens in the experience of what we call time? What happens is that we see certain objects enduring for a while, while their qualities change. If none of the qualities of anything were ever changing, we wouldn't notice the passage of anything like time at all. Time is what results from this tension between objects that are there and their qualities which are changing. So I sense time passing because I'm rotating this, or because the thoughts in my mind are suddenly changing, or because all of you are moving a little bit. This is how we sense the passage of time. Is the diagonal one is what we call space. Because what is space? Well, for one thing, all space is inferred. John Locke pointed this out. As you know from the case of babies, babies think they can grab anything. So a baby probably thinks the people in the back are toys, and babies try to reach the moon. Space has to be inferred. We have to learn how to infer how, how far away are these people. They're not tiny toys, even though these two people look this big. I know that they are normal-sized humans who are far from me. That is learned. And these people themselves are hidden from me, just like all things in themselves are hidden from me, and yet they're somewhat accessible through the qualities that they are manifesting. It's a, it's a combination of distance and nearness of the kind Heidegger always writes about. So that is what we call space. Now this is interesting because we have four, and time and space are two of them, and everybody talks about time and space or space and time, but those two are always the only two that come as a pair. Nobody ever adds anything to the list of space and time. It's assumed that those are the two basic cosmological structures that we all live in. I say no. I say that since space and time come out of a certain relationship between objects and qualities, we have to place the other two lines on the same level as space and time. What are they? that one 
essence, because we're talking about real objects and the real qualities that belong to them, which are the essential qualities that the thing needs to be what it is. That is the essence. And a thing is not necessarily identical with its essence. Aristotle raised this question in metaphysics. Is a thing the same as its essence? It's not so clear. That leaves one line. And that was the last one to come to me. Because it took me a long time to realize that Husserl is distinguishing between essential and accidental qualities of objects of the senses. And I used his own term for essence, which is eidos, the Greek word. Eidos is the strange one, because in it we had a real, uh, sorry, a sensual object, an object that exists only in the senses. Because I could be hallucinating a dragon right now, but that dragon still has real qualities, even though the dragon itself is not real. Because the dragon has hidden qualities that it needs to be that dragon. So, time, space, essence, Eidos. You will find this if you read my book, The Quadruple Objects. These are the four basic structures of the world. They have an aesthetic status because they involve the, sorry, the unstable relation between an object and its own qualities. And most of the object-oriented method in every field involves applying these terms to ask what's going on in any given situation. So it's now about 1.20. Is this a good place to stop and ask questions? Uh, you're going to touch upon uh, immaterialism, nothing. Yes, thank you. I should have done that near the beginning. When I talked about undermining and overmining, and you remember what those were. Undermining thinks you explain a thing by talking about the pieces it's made of. Overmining talks about what a thing does. And dual mining is both at once. Well, in a sense, materialism is the philosophy that best exemplifies this. Traditional materialism, of course, was about finding the physical particles that everything is made of. That's the old kind of materialism. But there's a new kind of materialism, you may have noticed. They call it new materialism, which isn't really about atoms and hard physical stuff. It's about everything is socially constructed, everything is contingent, everything is about embodiments in the world, everything is about, um, it could be about power. You know, Foucault is sometimes called a materialist. But Foucault is not really a materialist in the old sense, right? He's not interested in atoms or, or decomposing things into their physical parts. He's interested in the other kind of materialism, disciplinary practices and other things that shape who we are. So that's the overmining sort of materialism. And those are both very important. Like I said, all knowledge is important, and every kind of materialism is a knowledge. But if you're trying to avoid both of those reductions, the downward and the upwards, you need to talk about immaterialism. Now this, this term, in philosophy, this term usually is applied to Berkeley. Berkeley's absolute idealism, right? That there's nothing material, everything's just an image for our minds, for human mind or for God's mind. That's of course not what we mean about it, by it, because that will be just another overmining doctrine. Everything is just an image. What we mean by immaterialism is that what is between the undermining and the overmining is a form. And form, of course, usually means the outward look of a thing. But in the medieval context, it also meant the substantial form, right? The form that is really there in the thing that's different from the form that we see. And of course, this, this was kicked out of science, starting with Descartes, because Descartes thought physics was about simply describing the position and the speed of everything, not about any internal principle. And I'm not, you know, I'm not going to ask that science bring back substantial forms, but metaphysics, ontology can bring back substantial forms, because everything does have a nature as to what it is, and that nature is never fully visible. It's never fully shaped by its context, it's something deeper, and it's also never fully explainable by the pieces that the thing is made of. Or maybe it's explainable, but it's not the same as its pieces. Uh, I guess quantum chemistry is pretty good at predicting the properties of every chemical element. But even if it predicts, it, the chemical element as a whole is something different from the pieces of it. And so there's emergence. And immaterialism for us is about finding 
these substantial forms that are in the thing. And of course, you can't do that directly. You cannot translate a hidden thing in itself into prose terms until you hint at it indirectly. And there are a lot of ways to do that. Now, I, I was going to save most of the materialism for tomorrow's lecture, but just to give you a hint, most history, I think, overmines things. It also undermines it. History is a lot about overmining. Because if you're going to write the history of something, let's say you were going to write the history of the Dutch East India Company. You're going to find the things that it did that had the biggest impacts, right? So you're going to focus on the biggest battles the Dutch East India Company fought, the biggest shipments of spice that it ever did, um, and so forth. But not every one of those is important to the internal existence of the company, right? Some of the biggest battles it fought did not make the biggest difference to the company. So I brought it, I don't want to spoil it tomorrow, but this, I'll give you a little taste of it. There's this term symbiosis. And of course this term, this term comes from biology. It comes from an American woman named Lynn Margulis, who was one of the great scientists of the last 50 years. And if, some of you might know about it, but if you don't, you know, traditional Darwinian theory of evolution, change of species is gradual, right? Big fish have a baby, and it eats the baby of the little fish, and so fish gradually get bigger and stronger and meaner. Evolution is supposed to take place very slowly in that way. There have always been some people who think evolution happens in jumps. There's Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Aldridge, but I, the more interesting one to me is Lynn Margulis. What Lynn Margulis thought is that evolution happens when two life forms come together to form a new species. Uh, she theorized back in the 1960s that all the parts in the human cell, only some of them are naturally there, others came from the outside. Right? It was some of the parts of our cells were actually independent bacteria or viruses that came into our cells as parasites way back in history. And then over time, we needed them. We needed some of these to survive when the oxygen level increased or for some other reason. And so we formed a symbiotic relation where we reproduced these viruses and bacteria along with our own cells. And um, uh, here's, here's an example. When she was a student, she asked a very profound question of her professors. She was a student of biology, and she asked, did we ever see evolution happen in the laboratory in front of our eyes? And at the time, they said there's one case, just one case. They took fruit flies. What are fruit flies? In Spanish. Fruit flies. Fruit fly? Oh, okay. But also philia in Latin. I don't know if it's Spanish, but anyway. You know the fruit flies, these tiny little flies that they use in genetics. They put them all in a big tank big glass tank, and they divide it down the middle. This side of the tank, they slowly raise the temperature. This side of the tank, they slowly lower the temperature, just a little bit each day. And then after, I don't know, five or six months, the fruit flies could no longer mate together. So they're different species now. And so they kill the fruit flies, the poor things, and dissect them. And they find that the hot fruit flies had a virus in them. And the scientists said, oh, that ruins the experiment. It's contaminated by a virus. But Margulis said, no, that's the point. Why do you think they survived the heat? It's because they brought a virus in that enables them to survive the heat. That's why they became a different species. And so the evolution is actually only, it's rare. It only happens when two species come together to create a new organism. And I tried to apply this to history in the case of the Dutch East India Company. That there are, and I hypothesized that every historical object, whether it's a person, like your own life, or a historical institution, it will only go through really five or six changes. And it will come through a symbiosis. Think about your own life, no matter how old or young you are. Most of the changes that happen to you in your life, and I guess there's going to be around five or six important ones, are not because you're sitting around in your bedroom brooding about your life and who am I and how do I find myself, what am I? No, it's from something outside you, right? It's you get married or you have a very special friend or you join a profession or you join a university. 
Um, it's some connection you make with something outside of you that changes you irreversibly. Um, so my, my connection with philosophy, or my connection with Cairo, Egypt, where I lived for 16 years in the middle of my life, cannot, rever cannot be reversed. I cannot go back to the person I was before philosophy or before Egypt. These are the things, that, it's, it's gonna be around a half dozen for reasons I uh, haven't fully proven, but I'm pretty sure about that. In the case of the Dutch East India Company, I tried to find the five or six major changes. And I started doing this by realizing that you're making a connection with a thing, not with an action. We, we learn in school in America that the uh, a noun is a person, place, or thing, right? Nouns as a part of speech refer to a person, place, or thing. So what if we just assume that there's going to be about two people, two places, and two things on average? It's actually a little different in each case. I looked at that and I found that not all of the things that are important in the history of the Dutch East India Company actually transformed it. There are only a few. And it's, it's either five or six. I don't remember how many I came up with. There, there's one person only who changed the nature of the company. There are two places and two things, I think. And then maybe I added a third thing. Well, I did, in my new book, Pelican, Object Related Ontology, A New Theory of Everything, I did the same for the American Civil War. And some of the findings were not surprising and some were. The, the unsurprising finding was that the two most, two most important people in the American Civil War are General Grant and General Lee. Not very surprising. They're the leading Northern General, leading Southern General. They had a big fight at the ends with Grant winning 1865. The surprising result was which battles are the most important. Two battles, I decided, were the most important are not always the most famous ones. The most famous battle in that whole war was Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. This is where the South tried to invade the North and were defeated in 1863. It's the most famous, but it lasted three days. If you ever go to Pennsylvania, you can visit this battlefield. Um, this is where the South really is often said to have lost the war. But I argued that two other battles, one of them at Vicksburg, Mississippi, the other at uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, were actually the key to the war. Because that was, those were cases where the war took on a different character that could not be reversed. The geography of the war completely changed after those two. So as I said in the book, Gettysburg could have won or lost the war, but it could not have changed the war. The war changed only because of those other battles, Vicksburg, Chattanooga. And at some point, I'm going to write a longer book of history about something uh, to show how this works. Next time I'll try to choose a non-violent example because my two examples now are the first corporation that exploits Indonesians and then the American Civil War. So I feel like I'm turning into this ghoul of wars and battles and enslavement. I want to pick something that's very non-violent. I'm looking for the right example just to show that I can choose an example that doesn't involve fighting and killing. Um, we'll see what it is. So that's, that's how I try to use the materialist method. And so tomorrow I'll try to talk a bit about arts, architecture, history, politics, maybe a bit. Just show some applications of this method. Those of you who would like to come. So now it's 131. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate your coming. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a very clear question. Presentation of your philosophy, professor. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. And so uh, we begin this section. If anyone has a commentary question. <laughs> and if you don't want to ask me in English, you can ask in Spanish and it will be translated for me. Come on, it was easy. <laughs> It's okay. okay. <laughs> People always knew, yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, I want to go back not to the distinction between uh, objects and qualities that you talk about today, but the distinction between uh, the real and the sensual. Yeah. Because um, that's uh, what's, what bugs me a little bit, uh, that maybe in your theory, the sensual is like unreal, uh, when you make this distinction, so uh, I don't know if you can explain it in an, another way because in that way uh, time is not real, it's unreal because it's 
a relationship between uh, central objects and central bodies. Right. Um, real has different senses, of course, because you could say these things are essential if they're so real in a sense. I simply use the terminology real to mean the thing that exists whether anybody is perceiving it or not, and therefore it is hidden, therefore it is different from whatever we perceive in it. Since it's you asking this question, I want to bring up Lacan because I know you're interested in Lacanian psychoanalysis. And this explains the difference between object-oriented ontology and Zizek, for example, who's a follower of Lacan. Um, Those are the Collins' three most famous terms, and since I know you know this, but not everybody in the room probably knows the Collins theories. What's the difference between Freud and Lacan? Well, the biggest difference is for Freud, the unconscious is a real thing that's hidden behind your surface actions, and from time to time it causes us to make a mistake, or causes us to lose something, or causes us to have dreams, but it's a real thing in the world, this unconscious for Freud. For Lacan, no, it's not this real thing hidden outside. It happens in the gaps and the mistakes that happen at the level of the, the symbolic. The imaginary has to do with the mirror stage, when a baby at a certain age sees itself as a unified, wonderful, beautiful, desirable thing in the mirror. Even though inside it feels incompetent, it, you know, it goes to the bathroom inside of its diaper, it can barely talk, it can't get food for itself, it's totally dependent on its mother. But when it sees itself in the mirror, it sees itself as a desirable thing. This is connected with narcissism. The symbolic has to do with language, with social positions, social rewards, um, and then there's the real, which is not enough of a real for me. And this is my difference from Zizek. You came up to see us today last year. Uh, because for the Kenyans, these three are always linked. You cannot remove one without destroying the whole structure. And so there isn't really a real world independent of the symbolic for the Kenyans. The real is the trauma that happens when you can't symbolize something, right? the, at least in Zizek's reading. The real is that which is Trauma is the best way to say it. And so, therefore, the only real function of the real for Zizek and other Lacanians is to traumatize humans, and that's my objection to it. It's too much like Kant's thing in itself, or even Kant's sublime in a way. It's something that overpowers us. It's not something that does things, what parts of the real do things to each other. And parenthetically, let me say something about Merleau-Ponty. Here's the, I like Merleau-Ponty just like everybody. He has very good insights. And my background is in phenomenology. But Merleau-Ponty is one of those philosophers who's always called the philosopher of the future, right? That, oh, Merleau-Ponty is already way out ahead of us, and if we can just catch up with him, we'll enter a completely new philosophy. Now, Schelling is kind of like this, too. At least in America, there's always a Schelling renaissance every 20 years or so. That Schelling is really the more a philosopher of the future than Hegel. But Merleau-Ponty right now is really the big philosopher of the future. But there's a problem. Right? Merleau-Ponty says, we don't just look at the world, the world looks back at us. Okay, that's, that's nice, but it's not as new as it sounds because it's still the human and the world as the two things that are looking at each other. What about parts of the world looking at each other? You don't get that in Merle Ponty. Why? Because he's in Kant's tradition. If humans in one basket and everything else in the other basket, black holes, bones, metals, stars, it's all over here. Dolphins is all in one basket. And then we humans get a whole half of the philosophy. That's Kant's real legacy, and that's part of his legacy I don't like. I like the things in themselves. I don't like the idea that human beings deserve 50% of philosophy, because we're, we're pretty minor in the end. And there's a huge universe out there, and we are a tiny speck of dust. I mean, we are just, we're interesting to ourselves, of course. But that doesn't mean we deserve half of all philosophy for ourselves. And so this is my problem with Royal Ponty, with Heidegger, very uh, any of these figures. Uh, to me, it was Whiteheads who really opened up the possibility of talking about object-object relations in the same way as subject-object relations. And that's not surprising because Whitehead calls himself a pre-Kantian. He says he's trying to go back to the 1600s. This was his favorite period. But I think that um, making this distinction is uh, 
responding in a way to this uh, distrust in the sensual, in the appearances, mm -hmm. as not uh, uh, sufficiently real. Uh, I don't know if uh, we can talk about the sensual object being real, because you made uh, in the first place this di distinction. Right. That's only though because if you accept it, all experience is a translation. In theory, I will try to say it's translation without an original. Right? There's nothing but translations, nothing but signs. This to me is an, up, an overmining strategy. It's saying that there is nothing hidden behind the, the surf, play of the surface. And the problem with all the overmining strategies is they can't explain change, as Aristotle showed. They don't have a surplus there that allows new things to happen. And this is why I have to say there is a real that is somewhat discontinuous with the sensual. Except I'm saying that sensual objects have real qualities, which is the thing that surprises me most about my own philosophy. That, that was the shocking thing when I got to it. That Husserl really shows us that this apple, which is just a phenomenon, has real apple qualities, even if it's not really there. I can hallucinate a centaur or a dragon, but the, the dragon that I see still has real dragon qualities that make give it the essence of a, of a dragon. And so yes, that, that is one of the ways in which object-oriented ontology is more classical than most recent philosophies which try to affirm the realm of appearances as being all there is, whether it's Nietzsche or Derrida. So yeah, we are, we're, we're more Aristotelian in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Um, there's the, uh, a text by Andrew Cole, uh, which I think... Start to lose? Uh, no, it's not the one. I think it's the um, obscure, obscure uh, or dark objects or, or desired, if I can remember well. But on that text, he made the claim that the, the Kant that you base most of your of your lecture upon is the Kant of the critical of the, of the critique of pure reason from uh, 1791. But that you leave behind or you leave outside of your critique the Kant that you could find uh, perhaps in the um, critical of practical reason or the critical of, of judgment and he kinds of make the argument that your Kant uh, especially when you make well, when you um, try to um, like establish the harsh distinction between the so-called free critical Kant versus the you know the post or critical Kant right. per se that this same distinction doesn't really apply to Kant himself because he constantly violated this uh, like um, uh, distinction, this 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 like uh, artificial distinction in in Kant's thought. So my question is, is if, if that if, if that's something that um, really happens in your um, theoretical approach to uh, object or being an ontology, or if it's only because um, Andrew's goal uh, kind of uh, misread you. Because we have a Kantian here who has been studying Kant for the past 30 years. I'm not sure if he's present or if he's actually in class. But I was hoping that we could discuss this more in depth if, if possible. Yeah, um, I, I've met Andrew Cult, but I don't know that article. So there's a limit to how much I can explain okay. it. I want to read it now, though. Okay. <laughs> but I don't, not having read it, I'll just say that I'm not sure how that's going to work because the cons of the ethical philosophy, there is a distinction between the noumenal and the phenomenal self. Because on the phenomenal level, you can't explain all my actions in terms of the food I ate and my DNA. That's the problem. It's the moral self that is supposedly irreducible to that. So he, he does allow for both. Um, as a phenomenon, we are pieces of matter just like anything else for Kant, and so therefore we can be scientifically explained. Um, and yet there's this other self. That's the moral self, is ourselves is the thing in itself. So I'd be curious to see what his argument is. And then in the critique, I already use the third critique quite a bit in my new books. It's true, I haven't written much about the second critique. Not a lot, but uh, in my book, Dante's Broken Hammer, I've, I've talked about that a bit. So, what did you say the title was? Uh, dark Objects of Desire, if I can remember. Well, if you have dark a, Objects of the what? Uh, desire. Desire? Desire. Oh, desire. 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 desire, yeah. Okay. That's the title of the essay. I thought you had already read it. No. It came out, it came out like two or three years ago. 
you know, I just read Dark Deleuze, uh, and we did a lecture together this summer in Los Angeles. But I didn't know about this one. Nice guy, though. I like, I like Andrew. Huh. Come on, don't be afraid. <laughs> All right, so, so there is overmining and undermining, and there is dual mining, but like, what would you say would be mining then? Mining is the term I use for all three of the, any of those three. So if you say mining, then you have to say what are the forms of mining, overmining, undermining, and undermining. So it can't be just mining? No, you, there's, there's no mining in general, that's just a, a, a category they all fit under. Yep. Sure. I was wondering what was your relation to specifically Spinoza? Mm -hmm. Because um, recently, what you were just saying near the end, um, uh, of the relation between objects, well, in Spinoza, well, it is considered um, how objects interact independently of uh, subject and object, and even more so that there isn't, um, or it seems, it seems to me that there isn't neither uh, overmining or undermining in as much as a uh, thing, a mode, can be considered, yes, from its part, but also um, like a relation of a movement and rest. This is a real it's, uh, right now. What was that? Somebody's phone told me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. All right, yeah, I, I, somebody told me that Spinoza is very popular here at the university. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course, he's wonderful to read, and I always think Spinoza is very underrated as an analyst of the passions. He yeah, shows a lot of insight there. And of course, he, uh, you know, Deleuze, the wave of Deleuze has helped spread Spinoza back into popularity again. There's, there are obviously some differences uh, with Triple O. One of them, yeah, the, the idea of a single substance will be treated by Triple O as an undermining, similar to the Prusikai Agape one. And I know Spinozists like to claim that there is room for real individuals in Spinoza. I'm just not quite convinced by that. And so uh, since we have multiple individual objects in object-oriented ontology, we also have uh, something like freedom rather than the determinism found in, in Spinoza. And Quentin Maestro has made a funny point, um, which is that philosophies of necessity always go with stoical ethics, of course, right? Because if everything is, is necessary, there's no reason to get too upset about everything, stay calm. Mm -hmm. And since his philosophy is a philosophy of absolute contingency, he wants to build an ethics of regrets, where you're lamenting everything, you go, oh, I shouldn't have done that, it you know, changed everything. By my making that decision instead of that, it affected the whole world badly, like a Woody Allen, ethics of Woody Allen, kind of a neurotic thing. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the, the tendency of object oriented ontology will be to read Spinoza in undermining terms. And we got, we got to have a debate going through the text and seeing if he does actually account for uh, individual objects enough, but I'm inclined to say no. I was thinking a little bit about the thing that I think Alfredo said, that um, like the concept between real and reality, you know, mm -hmm. like in this case will be more like responding to a theory of phenomenology mm -hmm. that has to do with the uh, experience the object through the body, you know, and like through that we will give like a definition what the object is. And then the concept of real has to do with um, more like something that language cannot name. For. So it cannot be assimilated, you know, to the psych or the mind. And that case will be like something that will stay like out of comprehension or something like that. So it will cause um, anxiety or this state of psychotic maybe state, you know. That has to do with language, more with language in, in case of psychoanalysis. That the real is outside language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it's and yet it's still you know, when, when the comments talks about those boromian and knots. Mm -hmm. The, um, symbolic, imaginary, and the real are tied together. And actually, there's a fourth one, the symptom, the symptom. Um, what, what I've noticed is that the, the, I'm not sure that Lacan's influence has been good in art and architecture, for example, right? Because it becomes a kind of terrifying version of the sublime, 
where there's something out there that's so traumatic that we can't possibly put our finger on it. And so you got a lot of you get a lot of artworks in certain brands of contemporary art that try to give us the shock and the trauma of the real. Whether that be you know there's works on September 11th or there's um, you know there's Damien Hirst in England who put a, like a rotting body of a cow so that flies would come in the window. And then he had electric, he electrocuted the flies with electrical wires. Now it's obviously ugly and it's disgusting, but it's somehow supposed to give us the real. And Zizek did say something funny. He said that science and art have reversed, and not only funny, but true, I think. Science and art have reversed. It used to be art talked about beauty and science talked about the real. Now it's the exact opposite. All these science books are about how beautiful science is and how beautiful the universe is. Uh, Brian Greene in America wrote this book, The Elegance Universe, about string theory. And no artist will be caught dead talking about beauty now, right? It's all about the shock of the real. It's this, look at my dead cow electrocuting flies. <laughs> or I, I put a shark in a tank of formaldehyde. Or I make, I take dog shit and paint the Virgin Mary with it. Um, so in a way it has reversed. It's the artists who are trying to give us the brute encounter with the real. And I'm not sure, architecture also. People have tried to make an architecture of trauma. And the results are mixed, but not always good. So, I'm suspicious of the way the psychoanalytic reel is still too tied to the symbolic, because it, it ends up being a trauma for humans, rather than a reality that does certain things, whether or not we care. I mean, what, would the, what is the Lacanian position on science? I don't think it's, it's as sophisticated as it needs to be. I love reading him, though. At you know, times, you think he's just pulling a joke on you, but other times you think this is a really wise person who understands the human psyche. I have both of those moments when I read the poem. Yeah, oh, he, I think he was first to me. Could you explain a bit about the dormant objects? Oh yeah, thank you. I do have a concept of dormant objects, which is the idea of an object that exists, but is not currently having any effects and might never have any effects. And this, obviously, Bruno Latour doesn't allow for this, because for him to be an object is to have an effect. The reason I think there have to be dormant objects, or sleeping objects, is because, let's say, an object has its first effect. For me, it had to, it had to exist prior to that effect. And so, therefore, there had to be at least one moment when it existed that was not having any effects. So, um, the examples I try to use of this are political coalitions. Right? That you can say, um, I used to use the John McCain Victory Coalition, but that's, that's too old now, that's already 10 years old. I used to say, okay, maybe there was a coalition of voters out there for John McCain. He simply, fa his campaign failed to recognize them and appeal to them. But now it's, it's probably easier to talk about the Trump coalition because I didn't think it was there. A lot of us were shocked, and but I should be apologizing to all Mexicans at the beginning of my lecture. I'm sorry. It's, a, it's an embarrassing time for me to come to Mexico to have a president who is insulting all countries, but especially this country. And I hope he's in prison soon. But um, really, I think he. But I thought, okay, we just had a Barack Obama for eight years. Americans actually elected a black president. Maybe we're not as racist as I thought. Maybe, maybe the generations have changed. We're moving in a new direction, right? And then what happens? After Obama, we get Trump, who I, I don't think all his followers are racist, but I think they're either rich or racist in most cases, right? There are some people who just do support him for the stock markets or whatever they think he's gonna help. And then a lot of them, I think, are people who are still angry that Obama was their president for eight years. And where did these people come from? I didn't know it existed, but obviously it was there. And he somehow noticed it before any of the rest of us. And he capitalized on it, and that, that object, that coalition, had to pre-exist Trump capitalizing on it. I mean, he created some of it himself, but he also had to know it was there. And I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story. I was in Egypt during his whole reality TV show, so I never saw it. I don't know if it was showing in Mexico, The Apprentice. It was, it was the number one rated reality show in America. I, I never saw it because I was in Cairo and I was asleep when those shows were on. One really weird thing is that this show, okay, this, 
when was it running, like 2001 to 2008 or something. It was very popular with Latinos in America and also very popular with black Americans. Trump was actually the most popular white person with both of those groups for a number of years. And then what happened? What happened is he decided to attack Obama's birth certificates. And Obama's not a real citizen. His popularity with black Americans plunged. His, I don't know when exactly his popularity with Mexican Americans plunged, but certainly when he started his campaign by saying Mexico is sending us criminals, and certainly it plunged by then. So he, he seems to have made a conscious decision to sacrifice his popularity with these other groups in order to appeal to this group he must have known was there. Angry, white, working class, mostly men, frankly, a bit racist, more than a bit racist, people who are blaming foreigners for everything. So I, but I think the Trump coalition had to be there, and most of us who would call ourselves liberals or Democrats thought that this is in the history, right? This is, we've advanced beyond this. Obviously we hadn't, and so Trump had a kind of cynical eye that allowed him to see, and I, that might be an example of a dormant object, uh, something that a politician can see is going on that the rest of us can't see that is going on. And then Trump makes a relation with that coalition and he wins. None of us could believe that coalition was really there, but it was. Um, he somehow could be rude to people, get people angry, and we thought that was never gonna work. Um, I remember every controversy during his campaign, every time we all said, okay, that's the last straw. He says McCain is not a war hero because he was captured, oh, everyone's gonna hate him now. Or now he made this remark about other people, or he, you know, he got caught on that tape saying things about women. Oh, he's never going to win now. Then he kept winning. And it seems he can say anything he wants. So maybe he understands the political landscape better than we do. He's, he doesn't seem intelligent. But he must have some kind of animal instinct for what the landscape is really like in the United States. And it keeps, it keeps surprising any, most educated people in the U.S. are surprised again and again that he gets away with it. But he does. I, I just can't believe it. Anyway, that, that's, those are my usual examples of dormant objects. There are probably others. Um, physical objects can never be dormant objects, I would say, because physical objects always exist somewhere in space-time. So most, most likely it's going to be non-physical objects, like a coalition or like a... Um, I was in Egypt during the revolution. Nobody saw that coming either. The Egyptian revolution, the revolutionary spirit of Egypt must have existed before anybody knew it, at least a few days, right? Because suddenly it just took on a life of its own. Everybody is in the streets. And one of my colleagues at the American University in Cairo, professor of political science, had just finished a book and sent it to the publisher where the last sentence was, therefore, there could never be a revolution in Egypt. <laughs> and I would have agreed with him. And this was just two weeks before it. There was no sign at all. And luckily he had time to pull this away and erase the last sentence. He would have looked very bad. So yeah, th things, things that just come from nowhere and surprise people. The fall of communism in 1989, the, yeah, the Egyptian revolution. Um, but physical objects would probably be ruled out. Because how could you have a physical object that's not in relation to other things in space-time? In fact, maybe that's a good definition of a physical object. An object that can never be dormant, could never be non-active, or the one that's always relational. And what about the like uh, future species? What, what mm. like no, I don't think those exist. That would to think that would be more of a platonic position, where you think that there's this perfect form of a future bird species that just hasn't had any copies yet. Whereas I, I think there can actually be things that are created over time. Um, that are not yet dormant. So I don't think there's a dormant future bird species of the 28th century right now, most likely. Um, there might be an ecological niche that some animal hasn't discovered yet. Um, and in human society, there are certainly these niches. Like, haven't you ever been surprised that more people don't steal luggage at airports? Because it all looks alike, right? You could easily just grab one, and if somebody catches you, say, oh, I'm sorry, I thought this was mine. And then about half the time, you get away with stealing the luggage, and you can take it out. There's probably something worth selling. There's a strange honor system that people are still following um, of not stealing each other's luggage. It happens once in a while. 
But I can see that becoming a big crime. Why has that not happened yet? So maybe there's an ecological niche there for luggage thieves, but I don't think that means there's a dormant luggage thief who hasn't started acting yet. I just think there's an opportunity there that some criminal has not capitalized on. So I've also heard this. I've heard it said in America, criminal experts say the crime of the future is arson, setting fires on purpose. Because you can often get a lot of money out of it if you have insurance or you burn your building down. It's hard to prove. If you, yeah, if you do it right, it can look like an accident. And so they keep saying, eventually people are going to start setting fires to buildings all the time in huge numbers. Hasn't happened yet. But again, I would say there, was, there isn't a dormant object called arsonist. There's just an opportunity. I think in Tijuana that started already. Did it? Yeah, yeah. it already started not too long ago. But in Avenida Revolución, it's something that has been going on. By developers. So, oh, so the number of fires is increasing. Yeah. And are these people getting caught or are they getting away with it? No, they're not getting caught. Uh, that's, yeah, that's so we make it next. Um, we, we have a new crisis in the U.S., which is opioid overdoses and addictions. It's mostly affecting white working class people, women in large numbers, and just the number of deaths. If you open the newspaper in the United States, there will be, and usually the obituaries were old people. Now you open it, there's like seven people under age 40, and it never says it, but you always know what it was. Unless it says car accident, you know it was an opioid overdose. And again, I wouldn't say that there's a pre-existent opioid abuser, dormant object, that there is. So new things can happen, but there are some things that actually pre-exist their effects, I would say. The, the effect, um, and, and you can never know whether a dormant object is real. So again, in politics, we have this category in America called the soccer mom. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah. Soccer mom is the suburban white woman who's educated with kids and she is considered to be socially liberal, but pro-defense, right? Because she wants Americans to be safe. Social favor military spending, but she also favors government staying out of abortion and things like this. And no one really knows if this group exists. You have to look at the election data and see, does it look like all the suburban educated white women with kids were going for Hillary or for Trump? Actually, a surprising number went for Trump. But they, they went for Obama instead of McCain or Romney, although we can't prove they exist. And no one's gonna say, I'm a soccer mom, you know. <laughs> you have to kind of look at the look at the data. But yeah, there, there can be objects like that, that that have an effect. And also not just politics, but also brands have to take this into account. So Nike shoes surprised us all a few weeks ago. They adopted Colin Kaepernick for his for their advertising. You know, Colin Kaepernick is in trouble with Republicans because he was kneeling to protest police violence before every game. And so we thought, okay, he's too controversial. Nope, we never thought a company would use him, but Nike decided, yeah, we want the young people to get excited because who's buying the shoes? It's the 16 to 30 year olds. And he, Colin Kaepernick's kind of a cool bad boy, you know, and so let's put up a giant sign. So then all these old Republicans say, we're not gonna buy Nike, we're boycotting, but they weren't buying it anyway, right? <laughs> so the brand somehow has to look for an object there, which is the, the Kaepernick supporter. The Kaepernick, buying, Kaepernick supporting shoe buyer. I think that object had to exist at least slightly before it came into existence. Anyway, that's, those are some of my answers, attempts to answer your question. Uh, professor, I would like to make a commentary sure. on your presentation. Uh, for me, uh, your philosophy, object or uh, philosophy, it has uh, great uh, potentiality, no? um, but to use the analogy of the civil war, okay. In my in my view of philosophy, uh, I can say that there is the the north and the south <laughs> in philosophy. <laughs> So for me, the North is the progressive side of philosophy, which in my, in my mind is linked to materialism. And I see your philosophy 
as, as the South. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because for me, um, materialism, the overmining, what you call overmining, is linked to emancipatory movements. And I still believe that the, that the main force of philosophy is in following the analogy in the north. And I see what you're doing and it's great. But I think that there's more force in the over in what you call overmining or materialism in philosophy. But I, I also think that object oriented philosophy uh, can be uh, a great thing because I noticed some concepts in your in your dissertation uh, like surprise and opacity. Okay, I think that those concepts are are great and are and they can be developed further. But I, I also noticed that that. There is no, it's not clear your your definition of ob object is, I, I find it uh, a little bit loose or, or too broad. And so you made a, a great synthesis uh, in, in your presentation uh, when you say that uh, after Khan, there was a crossroad. Mm -hmm. I think that synthesis are are very necessary uh, in philosophy programs for our students because uh, studying philosophy can become uh, very like, like a I said like a phone book of philosophers, uh, too many names, dates, theories. And, and disperse knowledge. So I think that the task of a philosopher is in making synthesis. No? So I, I noticed that you made a synthesis. So, but that's my, my perception. And I want to know what you think about my North and South. <laughs> I'm proud to say that my family fought for the North. <laughs> That's, my great great grandfather lost a finger fighting to end slavery. I've always been proud of that. But um, I'll talk about politics tomorrow. Okay. But here, my issue with emancipation is that, it, yes, we want people to be more free, we want them to have more opportunities. But the yeah, to, to view emancipation as the kind of transcendental principle of politics is to make the modern assumption that we're thrown into a world and we're alienated by it, so we need to kind of somehow untangle it from us to gain greater freedom. Freedom is not the only thing we want. Right? We also want a good relationship with the things around us. We don't just want to be detached from everything. We want to be entangled with things in the right way, not, not the wrong way. I also think that a lot of the emancipatory tradition in politics does not pay enough attention to objects. And again, I don't want to already waste tomorrow's lecture, but I'll say a few things. Um, objects turn out to be very important politically in the sense that objects are what we use to stabilize human existence. Uh, Bruno Latour is a great example. Bruno Latour talks about, he and Shirley Strom did a paper together. Shirley Strom is an expert on baboons. So they, they went together to some country and watched baboons. And what they noticed is that baboons are a lot more social than us, in the sense that baboons are always watching each other. Which baboon is giving a back massage to the other one? Which one is feeding the other one? Um, 
baboons always stay close to the other baboons. Even if they found a good food source, they have to run after the other ones. And Lutzua makes the good point that we are less social than that. We stabilize ourselves with objects. So for example, um, we all have moments of crisis in our lives, but when I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to know my name, I'm going to know my position in society, I know how much is in my bank account, I know that I have a, a plane ticket from San Diego back to Los Angeles and that there's a hotel for me in Los Angeles, I have a wedding ring, I have a um, certain number of relatives, I know who they are, I know where they live, I know where I live. And as the tour makes a joke, he says, when you go into the post office and buy stamps, he says, thank God the man at the post office does not complain about his mother-in-law. He just sells you the stamps. There are, there are barriers we create so that we're not in constant social interaction. And so objects end up being the things that stabilize society. And so that a lot of, uh, my friend Levi Bryan has written a lot about this, that he thinks a lot more of the political left should be based on things like infrastructure, changing infrastructure in certain ways to give people better access. Um, he, he believes that blocking um, highways and blocking rail lines is a more effective mode of protest than just standing outside the White House and shouting, because he thinks the inanimate objects are key. And all I'm trying to do, you, you think the concept of object and object random ontology may be too broad, only as a starting point, only because at first we're trying to stop premature distinctions of what philosophy is about and what it's not about. And in the case of most modern philosophies, the premature distinction is the subject-object distinction or the human-non-human distinction. And in the end, we don't really know what the difference is between humans and animals even. Um, this is one of the weakest points of all modern philosophies. I mean, Descartes starts by saying that Animals are just machines. You can torture a monkey with a knife and it doesn't matter if it screams. Um, very harsh. We've had 400 years of modern philosophy and no one has ever really given a good explanation, not only of where the animal-human line is, but what different kinds of animals. It's always assumed that you're either a human or an animal and not much attention is paid to the difference between a dolphin and a cockroach, which is a huge one, or a germ and a, a monkey or something like this let alone plants, and there's more and more evidence all the time that plants think in some way. I predict this is going to be one of the bigger philosophical revolutions over the next century, that people are going to get much more sophisticated in talking about different life forms, uh, which is a real weakness of the modern period. It's either human or nothing. Um, I think we're, there's a lot of room out there. For, you're seeing a lot of books on the philosophy of plants springing up. I don't know if you noticed that in the United States, at least, and also in France, Seems like every year there are a couple more books about plant intelligence. Um, and so I, I think if I were just starting my career, I would really focus on something like that possibly as an option. Um, there's obviously Nagel's famous article on what it's like to be a bat. Heidegger talks about animals in the one lecture course. I don't think he does a great job. Uh, World poverty in 1929-30, fundamental concepts of metaphysics. Um, Agamemnon talks about animals, about the distinction between men and animals, for example. Right. But I don't remember Agamemnon distinguishing between different types of animals. Not quite, yeah. Which I think is the real trick. Um, what's the difference between a dolphin and a snake? Obviously, very big. How does philosophy account for that? You know, dolph dolphins and whales may be smarter than us. You know, they, we don't know what a whale brain does in most of its parts, it might be smarter than us. So, yeah, all the talk about emancipation, I worry that that's too tied to the idea of an alienated human who's unique and is trying to get out of the world and understand it, and maybe doesn't leave enough room for other living creatures. Uh, and I think plants also need to be thrown into the mix. And my friend Stephen Shaviro talks about slime molds, which show Stephen and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go so far as to be a panpsychist and say that everything is thinking, but there are people who make that case too. And David Chalmers says a thermostat has a mind because it reacts to the temperature changes in the room. So, anyway. Well, thank you for your response, and I apologize if my analogy was... No, it's okay. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? No? Okay, so... We will meet again tomorrow here for the
the application of oriented, uh, object oriented philosophy to architecture, arts, maybe politics, arts, politics okay? Maybe so, history since I wrote the book. Okay, mm -hmm. social sciences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so great. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for coming. professor's philosophy. And in today's session, uh, Professor Harman is going to apply, listen carefully, he's going to apply those concepts that I just mentioned to uh, at least three subjects. Art, architecture, and politics so that is going to be the uh, the subject of today's presentation and we are on a tight schedule today because there's there's going to be another uh, event here so we have to finish on time and also and sadly professor harman must take a plane this afternoon to go back to Los Angeles. So uh, he's going to to make a presentation in about an hour, an hour ten minutes. Afterwards, again, we are going to open a, a, a <laughs> session of Q and A, questions, answers, commentaries, and then around. 15 minutes to before 2 or 10 minutes before 2 well, we are going to have to end this event because there's going to be another event and we have to uh, respect the time so without further ado I leave you again with Professor Harman Thank you very much. I've had a wonderful time here, and you are all very serious listeners, and you ask tough questions. And then last night I was interviewed at Las Playas and had even tougher questions <laughs> more. So uh, I look forward to coming back. Uh, right now I'm not living in Los Angeles. I'm living in the Midwest in Iowa and just flying to Los Angeles. But if I move to Los Angeles next year, which I might, I look forward to visiting you again sometime. It's not very far, just a few hours in my car. And uh, Tijuana has really grown since 1994 when I was first here as a tourist. It was 24 years ago when I was a young graduate student. All right, so as Professor Felipe already told you, I will be talking at least about art, architecture, and politics. And if there is time, I will be talking a little bit about history as well. Let me draw a diagram, the, the fourfold diagram that I had yesterday on the board, just as a reminder. We can use this in some of our discussions. Gracias por venir. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hope you have a good time. Welcome, welcome. Just as a reminder, a lot of people will tell you that object-oriented ontology is about how objects hide and they can't relate to each other. That's true, but that's only part of it, as you can see. What, what object-oriented ontology is really about is that there are two kinds of objects, two kinds of qualities, and they are, the objects are always in a very loose relation with their own qualities. Now, what's interesting about that loose relation, it means that sometimes objects can lose some of their qualities and remain the same object. Then there's also a very uh, famous theory in sociology called the strength of weak ties. Mark Granifetter, I think he's at the University of California at Berkeley, came up with this theory in the early 1970s. 
And the theory is that weak ties with people are often more important than they look. So, for example, your very close friends and family members provide a lot of emotional support. They're always there for you when you need them. But most of your opportunities in life come from loose acquaintances, people you know just a little bit. So, uh, I have my, my wife and my very close friends, and then there is also Alfredo who's here somewhere. Yeah, and we, you could say we did have a loose tie because he came to Los Angeles uh, to see my debate with Zizek, and then through that loose tie that we made, he just came and introduced himself afterwards. All of this happened because of that first encounter, and then Professor Vidibili arranged everything uh, to make it final. And I didn't know, I, I met you once, I'd never met you until two days ago. And yet look what happened. This wonderful event happened because of a loose acquaintanceship. That's not going to come from my friends because my, my, friend, my close friends and family cannot provide me a new link to another world because they're in the same world I am. And it's something analogous here with objects. Somehow the fact that they have a loose relationship with their own qualities makes it a more powerful relationship. And what object-oriented ontology does is it tries to explore the way in which objects sometimes become detached from their qualities, sometimes add new ones while remaining the same object. I'm going to talk first about arts because I said aesthetics is first philosophy. Aesthetics I use as a broader term than arts. Aesthetics for object-oriented ontology means all of these four relationships between the two kinds of objects and their two kinds of qualities. So we redefined aesthetics to mean that. Arts has to do with this diagonal one between the real object and its sensual qualities. Why is that? Well, because I said yesterday, the artwork cannot be replaced by description. A scientific object can be replaced by a description. If you ask me what is an electron, or if I ask a scientist what is an electron, they can tell me everything we know about an electron. And that's a very good description of what an electron is. It has a negative charge, it has a certain mass, it occupies certain orbits in the atom. Um, that, so you can do that in the case of the sciences. You can paraphrase a name in terms of its qualities. You cannot do that with an artwork. If I ask you what is um, Rembrandt's Night Watch painting, you can describe it to me, but unless I see it, it's, it's not very helpful. You cannot replace an artwork with a description of it. You actually have to experience it. Now, this is not a new idea for us. This, of course, is part of Kant's critique of judgment. So Kant's third critique, uh, however it's translated into Spanish, uh, the, the key, one of the key points about Kant's conception of beauty is that it cannot be conceptualized. You cannot give rules for what makes something beautiful. Like you cannot say symmetrical things are more beautiful because sometimes they're not. Sometimes asymmetrical things are more beautiful. You cannot say happy things are more beautiful than sad things. No, because sometimes sad artworks are, ha are better than happy ones. There is no rule you can make for what makes an artwork better or worse conceptually. You actually have to experience it. And this is what Kant calls taste. Right? Taste is the kind of non-conceptual sense we have of the beautiful and the not beautiful. Now there's also the sublime in Kant along with beauty. And sublime is a word we throw out in object-oriented ontology. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the sublime is supposed to be something of an infinite magnitude. It can be infinite size or infinite power. So, the sublime, he calls the, the mathematical sublime is infinite size. So if you go out and look at the starry sky at night, he wouldn't say this is beautiful, he'd say it's sublime, because you're getting a sense of the infinite size of the universe. Likewise, if you use uh, infinite power, this is the dynamical sublime. So if you're standing on a cliff and you see the tsunami come in and hit, as long as you're safe, you can experience this as sublime. It's something just so powerful. As long as you're not hurt and nobody you care about is being hurt, it's another kind of sublime. Now, why do we not like the sublime in object-oriented ontology? It's because my colleague Timothy Morton has written a book called Hyperobjects. It might already be translated into Spanish. No, it's an important book. It's, it's in Italian now. Soon it will be in Spanish, I'm sure. <laughs> and what he says in that book that I think is true is that infinity is overrated. What's more important are very large, finite things that are beyond the human scale. So. For example, the, the effects of global warming are not infinite. That's not the problem. The problem is they will take 100,000 years to fix, and we'll all be dead, and our grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren will all be dead by then. 100,000 years for the Earth naturally to put the carbon dioxide back in the rocks and bury it into the water. It's going to take a long time. It's not infinite, 
it's just a very long time. And the same for the Pacific Garbage Patch, it's twice the size of Texas. It's not infinite, but it is so large we can barely imagine. Um, uh, there was also a story, a, a scary story last month, that they figured out that the bombing from World War II, World War II damaged the atmosphere of the Earth. Did you see this? The shock waves from the bombing in Europe was enough to send vibrations up and damage the outer layer of the atmosphere. And they don't know if it's fixed yet. And that was World War II, before, even before atomic bombs were, were tested and used. So these, these are things that are very large, they're not infinite, but they're so much larger than the human scale. So we try to replace the sublime with this sense of the hyper object, something that's not infinite, but it's so large that, that we cannot master it. Um, okay, now, so I agree with this part of Kant. You cannot put beauty in words. You have to experience it. You cannot paraphrase aesthetics in terms of concepts, right? If I say, like yesterday, Homer, a wine, the wine dark sea, that's a metaphor. I cannot explain to you exactly what wine dark sea means. Just, just as I cannot explain what a joke means without ruining it. <laughs> I cannot explain the Godfather's threats and offer he can't refuse without ruining it. There are lots of indirect communication in human life like this. And you, and you put it in literal words is to ruin it, it's to change it. Not always ruin, sometimes it's good. Science puts things in literal terms and that's helpful. But you make the sacrifice of oversimplifying a thing when you explain it literally. All right, so that's a thing I like about Kant. I also like about Kant the idea that the artwork is somehow cut off from its effects on the outside world. This is called formalism. And Kant never uses formalism when he's talking about artworks, but it's implied. He uses formalism in his ethics, meaning that in Kant's ethics, of course, you're not supposed to care about the consequences of your action. It's supposed to be about whether it's right or wrong. So if it's the Second World War and you're hiding Jewish people in your attic and the Gestapo asks, are there, are there Jews hiding in your attic? You can't really lie, according to Kant. He says you don't really have a right to lie for philanthropic reasons. Uh, there, it's, there's no contextuality to the ethics of Kant. Well, the same with his, what he thinks about artworks. The, the artwork is cut off from its surroundings. Now, this is sometimes challenged by people who want to view art in political terms. Most formalists will say, no, you can't do that. The artwork is something separate from the political effect of it or something like this. Now, I agree only partially with that. I, there are plenty of good examples of political artworks. Plenty. Uh, in the United States, we have Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is most famous as a novel, mostly because it helped start the end of slavery, helped start the Civil War. And there's Picasso's Guernica, and there are, there are quite a few other examples, and that's fine. However, I would still make the point these political artworks are only connected to certain parts of their surroundings. They're not tackling all political issues at once. They're focusing themselves on, in the case of Guernica, the brutality of the Spanish Civil War. They're not dealing with necessarily feminism and all the other political issues that were going on at the time. They're focusing on the Civil War and the violence of it. And so even a political artwork is not infinitely political. It incorporates some aspects of the environment into the work. Now, what did I not like about Kant's aesthetics? Well, Kant famously says that beauty is not about the object. It's not about the art object. It's about the transcendental faculty of judgment that all humans share. So it's really about us. And he thinks that since we're all made the same way, we should all agree with beauty, uh, about, about beauty. We should all, if our taste is developed enough, we should all agree which artworks are the most beautiful, more or less. Now, the interesting thing is that the formalist critics who are most famous in America in art, and that is Clement Greenberg and Michael Fried. Michael Fried is still alive. They simply reverse that. They say that the object is important, the human, the holder, is not so important. So I'll just make a quick little chart here. on the left it's because Kant thinks that beauty is about us. Greenberg and Fried are on the right because they think beauty is about the object. But despite that opposition, they still think that the object and the subject should be separated. This is the modernist assumption at the basis of all of these theories. 
And I don't like that. I don't like the idea that the object and subject are split in half. And the reason I'm, I don't like it is because of what happens in Kant's ethics. Some of you may know Max Scheler's critique of Kant's ethics. Max Scheler, the very colorful German philosopher who died in the 1920s, did a very nice critique of, of Kant's ethics. And a couple of the things he says, one of them, he says, Kant is right. Ethics should not be about the consequences of your action. It should not be about the context. So he's right about that, but he says there's a certain sublime emptiness to Kant's ethics. You can get these very abstract maxims about what is good. When in fact, for Shaler, ethics is about love, meaning passion. It's your passion for a thing or a, a practice. This is what ethics is really about for Shaler. And one of the consequences is that different people and even different nations have different ethical vocations. And so it becomes personalized, in a sense, for Shaler, that it's not for Kant. The ethical unit, in other words, is not just the ethical principle, it's the person plus the object, both. This is what makes ethics. A person is an ingredient in an ethical action, and each of us is different. And so there might be certain actions that are binding on some people and not others. So if one of my parents is sick, I need to fly home and see them. You don't all need to fly with me and see them. You don't know them, right? It's, it's binding on me, it's not binding on all of you. Or if, um, if you are a specific lover of a certain building, and that building is about to be torn down by the city, you are the one person who has the ethical obligation to try and go save the building, perhaps. For each of us, there's a different ethical uh, vocation. And I started thinking about why no one had tried to apply this to Kant's aesthetics, in the third critique. Uh, because you can also see that different people have different aesthetic vocations. One of the ways you can see this is by looking at famous artists and writers who had passion for certain earlier artists and writers who are not necessarily the most famous. I was thinking of T.S. Eliot, the American poet, who later moved to England and became an English citizen. Uh, he had a very special passion for the French poet Jules Lafogue, who is, is not really one of the very greatest French poets of the late 19th century. But something in his poetic voice really inspired Eliot and enabled him to become the poet he was. And that, you wouldn't say that all poets have to master the works of Jules Lefort. You'd say all poets should be reading Baudelaire or all poets should be reading Homer or Dante. But sometimes you can see a very personal attachment to someone who is outside of the canon as a model, as a forerunner. Okay, let me now get to the meat of my argument though, which is that there are two things that Greenberg and Fried say that needs to be reversed, and this gives us a new sense of art. What? Let's start with Michael Fried, who's the younger of the two and is still alive, as I mentioned. He just visited us in Los Angeles last year. Michael Fried is against theatricality. The way to avoid theatricality in painting, Michael Fried thinks, is that the figures in the painting should look like they are paying attention to each other, not to us. If it looks like they're paying attention to us, the effect seems very cheap, according to Fried. It seems like a, a melodramatic kind of painting. They should be absorbed with each other. Now there's a problem with this, two problems. One of them is that Fried even has to admit that this doesn't last for very long in French painting. If you look at paintings by Manet, who's the first modern painting according to modern painter, according to Fried, usually there's one person in the Manet painting who is looking at you directly. That's because Fried said it became impossible to paint anymore in a way where they looked absorbed with each other, it looked fake. And so the way to cancel that was to have one person looking directly at you. And so even Fried, who's anti-theatrical, admits there has to be a theatrical component to art, which means the person has to be the beholder the person looking at the art has to be involved in it. Even he admits that. So that's the first thing I want to say in an object-oriented interpretation of art, that theatricality is inevitable. Because there, if there's no one experiencing the art, it's not art. Right? If, if uh, all humans die in a nuclear war or a plague, the paintings will still be around, the sculptures will still be around. But unless there are some animals who recognize it as art, it won't be art. In other words, just like ethics is made of two ingredients, the object and the person, aesthetics is made of two ingredients, the work and the beholder. They come together. 
they form a new hybrid object, just like hydrogen and oxygen together make water. You can't have water without hydrogen or oxygen. You cannot have a painting without the objects and the beholder. So all art is theatrical. And this goes back to what I said about metaphor. I only gave you a partial theory of metaphor. Remember, I used wine dark sea from Homer as a metaphor. And I put up the metaphor sea dark wine, which is the opposite. And I pointed out that those are both metaphors, but they're different metaphors. Because in, the, in this one, you're talking about the sea, and you're saying it has dark wine qualities. In the other one, you'd be talking about the wine, saying it has the qualities of the sea. So what we have in this metaphor is we have a sea that is somehow has wine qualities orbiting around it, like moons orbiting a planet. But we can't understand what a wine dark sea would be like and so the wine dark sea, but sorry, the sea becomes the real object. We're not sure what that sea is. And since that sea is missing, it's vanished like a Kantian thing in itself, we ourselves have to play the role of the object. We ourselves become the support for the wine qualities. I theatrically perform the wine dark sea. In other words, I become involved. I perform the metaphor in my mind. I become an actor. You know, we call this method acting. Uh, in Russia, it was called the acting system of Konstantin Stanislavsky, if you know that name, the great acting teacher, where you try to really imagine that you're the person. Uh, so that uh, Daniel Day-Lewis used to stay in character for the whole filming of the movie. Um, when Marlon Brando came to the audition for The Godfather, he came already in character. As soon as he walked in the door, he was Don Vito Corleone. Um, there's this new movie now about Dick Cheney called Vice with Christian Bale playing Cheney. And he looks, I haven't seen the movie, but he looks so much like Cheney, and he's only about 43 years old in real life. And someone told me he had to gain a lot of weight, so he was just eating pies every day. Yeah. Right? And now he's, he said, I'm 43, I'm going to have a hard time losing this weight now. So I'll probably be Dick Cheney size the rest of my life. I can't lose this weight again. That's serious acting, right? You're actually becoming the same weight as Dick Cheney in order to, to play him. And this is what we do with metaphors. We step in in place of the metaphors. Now, one of the consequences of this, these formalists don't like any of the art from the 1960s onward that was theatrical, whether it's performance arts, installations, conceptual arts. These critics tend to be fairly conservative. They like painting and sculpture for the most part, with a few exceptions. They like some video art, maybe. And so this encourages us to put renewed importance on a theatrical artist, such as Josef Voice in Germany, who did a lot of performance type pieces. Okay, now that's that's how I would try to change Freed's theory. I would I would tend to appreciate theatrical art more than he does. Greenberg has a different issue. Green, if you've ever read Clement Greenberg, he is the one who thinks that content of paintings is basically unimportant. Right? He's famous. He's a, a champion of abstract art. He says content is literary anecdote. It's just a story that ought to be in a novel. It shouldn't be in a painting. All painting should do, he says, is it should realize that it's essentially a flat canvas. The background is a flat canvas. And all of the content of the painting should be letting us know that it realizes it's a flat canvas. This is why he loves cubism the most, right? Cubism paints very unimportant content usually. It's a violin or a candlestick, but it's printed in, or it's painted in many different planes as if to show us, yes, I realize we're in a flat medium, painting is a flat art, and therefore I'm flattening the whole person's face onto the surface. Different, different sides of the face at once. There's a problem with this, which is his assumption that the background is one, the background is flat, and all of the content is dealing with the same flatness. In object-oriented ontology, of course, every object has its own hidden background. So this, this has a real object behind it that you're only seeing in distorted form through perception. This is a real object that you're only seeing in translated form. And so every object has its own medium for object-oriented ontology. And so therefore, we also favor artworks that, where the elements are more loosely connected. They're not necessarily woven together into a perfect whole, where the individual elements of an artwork all have their own depth. It's not just the artwork as a whole that has a depth. So uh, I don't know if, if that made sense, but I have to move on to the next topic. So I hope that's at least something for you to chew on. I have a book called Art and Objects it should be out in the spring. Uh, and Alfredo was reading Dante's Broken Hammer, where I talk about a lot of this. That came out two years ago. 
um, one of my least, least read books so far, for some reason. I'm very fond of that book. It's an interpretation of Dante combined with an interpretation of art. But I've extended those ideas to the visual arts uh, in arts and objects. Okay, let me talk briefly about architecture, since I teach at an architectural school. And it took me a long time to figure out why are architects interested in me? Didn't really understand. Um, some of it's accidental. I had a friend as an undergraduate named David Rue, and he's an architectural theorist, architect, and he teaches at SciArc in Los Angeles, and he was one of the people that got me to, to move there when I needed to leave Egypt because my wife got a job in America, long story. So, and it turns out it's a very stimulating place for me because I'm a student again. I'm learning, learning every day as I learn more and more about architecture. Okay, so what would an object-oriented architecture be like? Well, you could say there have been three great waves of philosophers influencing architects over the last half century. The first, of course, was Heidegger. And Heidegger wrote his famous essay, Building Dwelling Thinking, about architecture. And this has manifested itself in what they call phenomenological architecture. And some of this is fairly famous. Peter Zumthor in Switzerland has won the Pritzker Prize for the best architect some years ago. And what they are focused on in phenomenological architecture is a certain human experience. So they use very beautiful wood and the metal sparkles and they have the sunlight looking very nice. And Sumtor has built some very nice steam baths in Switzerland and they are very beautiful, um, wonderful experiences to see these buildings. However, sometimes you feel like you're on the set of a Wagner opera. They're a little too Nordic, a little too Germanic. Looks like Heideggerian mythology put into action. And there, there might be political questions about that, right? Because Heidegger's conception of Heimat or homeland is sort of a racist concept. Right? Because what he means is that blonde, white-skinned people belong to Germany. They are dwelling on their German homeland and not the outsiders who shouldn't be here. So there's that issue. Uh, and dwelling in general is politically suspicious, I think, for that reason. But th this leads to some nice buildings. And there's a guy, Christian Norberg Schultz, who is unfortunately no longer alive, who wrote a whole book called uh, Genius Loci about how to apply Heidegger's principles to architecture. So that was the first wave. The second wave was Derrida, which was in the uh, uh, 70s, more the 80s. 1988, there was a major show on deconstructivist architecture. And today we still have Peter Eisenman, who's an important architect at Yale with his practice in New York, who in, you might know his famous Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. It's actually quite wonderful. It's uh, these cubes. And as you walk into the cubes, they get taller and taller because you're walking down and they go larger and larger. And I think this is supposed to represent how the Holocaust started small with small discrimination and then it got larger and larger as the war went on. And it's also very political because it's only about a block away from Hitler's bunker where that was. And there's a small sign now that shows where Hitler's, well, it's still underground, you're just not allowed to go in it. They're worried that Nazis will come and celebrate there and things like this. So they, they try to discourage people from, actually they forbid it. People cannot go in the bunker, but it's there. And you can see where it was, where Hitler finally died. Um, so the Derridian influence in architecture is more about trying to disrupt our sense of comfort and safety. It's not about dwelling in the homeland. It's about trying to make us feel estranged from that. So you might have slanted windows, or you might have a skyscraper painted pink, or any, anything that's designed to disrupt your sense of, of normalcy. Then the third wave, which started in the 1990s, was Deleuze, of philosophers influencing architecture. And I think uh, one of the obvious influences of Deleuze is since he talks about continuous becoming, you get buildings that are very gracefully curved. There aren't corners or sharp edges. And so if you know Zaha Hadid's work, she unfortunately died two years ago. Uh, she does these beautiful curving flowing shapes and was one of the greatest architects of our time. Um, and, and she wasn't really a theorist. She just designed buildings. But she, uh, her right hand man was a guy named Patrick Schumacher who still teaches in London. And he's written a book trying to defend her architecture based on his own theory. And his theory is somewhat Deleuzean. It's this idea that there should not be corners, there should not be sharp edges. The building should flow very neatly into its environment so that it's hard to tell where the building stops and the environment begins. He admits that he doesn't know where to put the doors and the windows <laughs> because doors and windows always break up the continuous flowing and curving. And he ultimately says that all the buildings should be communicating with each other in the city. That all the buildings should be transparent so that there's more possible interactions between them. And finally, he, he has his own uh, 
questionable politics. He says the city should let him design all the buildings in the city to make sure that they all fit together perfectly. <laughs> so there's a little bit of an authoritarian streak there maybe. I know Patrick and I like him, but that, that might go a little too far. And like any movement, I think after about 20 years of dominance, the Rosian architecture is starting to, to fade a little bit. Oh, another thing, you know, Deleuze talks about the folds when he talks about Leibniz, his reading of Leibniz. You had architects actually putting folds in buildings to try to copy what Deleuze is talking about. And that might be too literal. So object oriented and ontology arrived in architecture at a time when they're looking for new ideas. Some, a couple of people have said object oriented and ontology will be the next great philosophical influence on architecture. That might be premature because there haven't been really any buildings constructed yet that claim an object oriented influence. But I want to tell you there are, there are a lot of people trying it. I think there are two extreme options, um, both people that I know. Uh, one of them is my colleague Tom Wiscom at SciArc. Spelled like this. W-I-S-C-O-M-B-E. And you can search for him on Google and see some of his buildings. He may become somewhat famous because he's, he won the competition to build a new electronic billboard in West Hollywood that has three sides and is going to be uh, changing video advertising on three sides. And when that goes up, every actor in the world is going to see it as they pass through Hollywood. And uh, it might set a new trend for billboards, but he also does a lot of other things. Now, what Tom has written an article about object-oriented architectural theory. It's called, um, uh, has the word, I don't know the exact title. Towards a Flat Ontology of Architecture is the subtitle. The Discreteness of Objects may be the title. You can find this online free. And he says there are three techniques he would use to emphasize the points of object-oriented ontology. The first is what he calls objects in a sack, it's where you do have basic geometrical shapes in the building, but they are covered over by a loose outer envelope that looks like a blanket or a sheet that has been thrown over the objects. So you can sort of see traces of the objects underneath the outer layer, but you're not exactly sure what they are, which of course relates to the object-oriented idea of an object that's withdrawn from direct access. You can only hint at it, so you can allude to it. Uh, sound more like a video game than a... <laughs> the second technique he uses is raising buildings above the ground as an attempt to decontextualize them because he thinks there's been too much emphasis on the, on the building blending in ni uh, too nicely with the ground. So he raises it above on a plinth. The third technique he uses is he creates what he calls tattoos on the surface of the building. They are arbitrary decoration that have no relation with the structure. So it creates a tension between the building structure and its outward ornament. And those three ideas and others he's been exploring in his own work. So that's that's more what you would that's something that sounds very much like an object-oriented technique. None of that is surprising. It's all quite powerful, but none of it will surprise you if you know what Triple O is about, object-oriented ontology. The other extreme Mark Foster Gage was the assistant dean of architecture at Yale, and I'll be actually teaching a studio with him at Yale next fall. Um, so I'll get to talk to him a lot about this. Whereas Tom Wiscom is trying to hint at something deeper in the building that you can't see, which is that real object central quality line. Mark Foster Gage stays on this lower line, central object and central quality. And if you have your phone and want to Google his, right, right now, Google Mark Foster Gage skyscraper, and you're going to see this wonderfully crazy building he has proposed for New York City, the west side. It looks neo-Gothic. It looks like all kinds of crazy objects pasted together. Donald Duck and geometrical shapes, and uh, I hope it gets built. It will be the craziest thing in the New York skyline. And what he's doing there is he's trying to graft objects together. He's not trying to say that there's something hidden that you can't see. It's all there on the surface. But you end up with this crazy ornamentation with objects fused together that don't really belong together. So that's the other possible technique you could use. And there are others. But these are the two extremes right now, I would say, of, of how people are using object-oriented architecture. So maybe I'll switch now to politics briefly. I should erase part of the board, though, because I need more board space. Okay, 
Okay, so as you know, modern politics, by which I mean politics since the, the French Revolution, is basically structured around the difference between left and right. We all live with this distinction. And it goes back, of course, to the French Revolution, where the leftists were sitting on the left side and the rightists were sitting on the right side. And we've, we've digested this. It's part of our everyday life. For everybody we know, we have some idea how far left or how far right they are on the spectrum. And sometimes people say that the opposites will meet. So you have some people claiming that Stalin and Hitler are the same, even though they're left and right. Or a more recent example in the, in the last American election, something that really surprised me is a lot of people had, a lot of people's top two choices were Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, who seem like opposites, right? You've got Trump and then you've got Bernie Sanders who's basically a socialist of some sort, right? He wants free education in the United States, free healthcare. So what is it that makes the two of them appeal to the same person. Well, people say that's because at a certain point left and right meet, they're both in opposition to the status quo or whatever. We don't need to answer that question today. But left and right is the left and right is the basic opposition that we are used to in modern times. I wrote a book on Bruno Latour's politics. Bruno Latour is my favorite living philosopher. He's known more as a sociologist than an anthropologist, but I think he's a very important philosopher. And you might not have read him because philosophers don't read him yet. I've written two books about it. One was about his politics. And I was trying to figure out what his politics are. I was asked to write this book, or rather volunteered, and I wasn't sure what his political theory was. And then I figured out an indirect way to approach it. I think rather than left and right, what's really going on in modern politics is an opposition between what I call truth politics and power politics. I'll put that on the board. the difference between left and right. Truth, uh, theories of truth politics are more common on the left, but you also find them on the right. This, this is the idea that we, we pretty much know what a good political system would be, but it's being stopped by evil oppressive forces that are blocking us, whether it's class interests or whether it's other negative forces that are preventing this paradise on earth of political truth from coming into being. We just need to struggle and then we'll get it. There's no question that we know what it is. It has to do with equality or it has... Rousseau is a good example, right? Rousseau thinks that by nature, humans are very sweet creatures. Mm -hmm. It's society that has corrupted us. And we can't go all the way back to the state of nature because you know we need farms and things like this, but we can at least get closer to the state of nature. We can stop millionaires from passing on all their wealth to their children and making things a little more fair. Or Marx, you know, Marx basically thinks he knows the truth of the class struggle simply a question of increasing class consciousness and eventually the dictatorship of the proletariat. But there are also right-wing versions. There are, there are theories of natural law that think they know what the political truth is. Uh, in America, we have the Straussians who are very powerful, uh, probably more than in any other country. They've advised pre the younger President Bush. And uh, they tend to think of, of political truth as being something like Plato's, that the philosophers should lead, but the philosophers have to disguise who they are and pretend they're not destabilizing. So it's a different sort of truth, but it's still truth. And then on the other side, you have people that think that there either is no political truth or it's irrelevant. The strongest person wins, right? So you have to win. Hobbes or Carl Schmitt uh, were waging an existential struggle for survival. Um, and any question of truth or falsity comes after that. First, we have to win or survive. Now, there's a problem that these two methods of looking at politics share in common, which is that they both think they have political knowledge. In the first case, it's some specific theory of what the good state is. In the other case, it's that there is no truth. It's just all a power struggle and the strongest person wins. Now, of course, object-oriented ontology does not really think knowledge gets to the bottom of things. Right? Any form of knowledge is a form of undermining or overmining. And therefore, we need to try to find a kind of politics that is not a knowledge. And originally, I was raising this issue in connection with Bruno Latour's politics. And my own theory started growing slowly out of this. Uh, here's what Latour says. Uh, Latour is interested in the conflict, or the debate, I should say, between John Dewey and Walter Lippmann. You probably know who John Dewey is, American pragmatist philosopher. You might know, not know who Walter Lippmann is, but he was one of the world's most famous journalists in the 1920s. 
So Spelling is getting so bad. Since this is being live streamed, I don't want to make a fool of myself by leaving an incorrect spelling. So I will just search for Litman really quickly. I used to be a good speller with age. It's two ends. Okay. I caught myself in almost a time. Okay, Litman. Litman wrote a very interesting book called The Phantom Public. And in there he discusses what is the American ideology. The American ideology that we all learn in school is we are a democracy and in order to be a democracy and remain a democracy, we need to educate our people so that people can make wise voting decisions. Well, look what's happened. It doesn't seem to be working very well. <laughs> and that's what Lippmann warned against. Lippmann warned that people don't know enough. People are going to make stupid decisions. Democracy in America is doomed. We can still keep it as a kind of a shell but ultimately, America needs to be run by technocrats who are experts in every area. This was Lippmann's idea. Very, very sad conclusion. And John Dewey read that book, and he was very interested in it, but he drew exactly the opposite conclusions. Uh, Dewey's conclusion was, you don't have to be an expert on everything. Right? Yeah, we can all vote, but in terms of political involvement, you can get involved in the issues that interest you. But you don't have to be involved in everything. I mean, I don't know anything about atomic physics, but if, if atomic waste is going to affect my water supply, then I can get involved and learn as much as I need to learn. And so Dewey thought there was still a, a chance for democracy. People come together and make coalitions on specific issues. Not every citizen needs to get involved in every issue. Some, some issues are so important that everybody will get involved. But there's plenty of room for people only to get involved on this and this and this and this. Um, without having to be absolute experts on it. So Dewey, like Latour now, does not think politics should be dominated by experts. Anything that concerns anybody is something they can and should get involved with. Other things can just be managed, right? Like, I don't really know how the sewage system works in Los Angeles, and unless there's a big problem with it, I will let the experts in the water department of Los Angeles deal with this. Um, I will let the highway engineers in Los Angeles worry about the roads and tell the traffic it's too bad and I have to complain as a citizen to the government. And so Latour is coming out of the same place as Dewey and Dewey's idea is that you simply reach a consensus about an issue. You never reach knowledge. It becomes a kind of political uh, dialogue that is not governed by a technocrat because there is no political knowledge. Right? That ultimately, there's, the object of politics is unknowable and you simply try to reach some sort of modus vivendi with people who might not like you, right? You might be absolutely opposed to the interest of the oil companies or the factory owner, and yet they exist, right? You have to take account of them in some way and reach some sort of settlement that is appropriate to all sides. And this, of course, is sometimes accused of being not revolutionary enough. This is why the tour is not beloved on the left. But I think there's something to be said for a politics that does not claim knowledge. And that's, that's the first thing that I think Latour contributes to political philosophy. The second one is the role of objects. I mentioned this yesterday, but I'll say it briefly again. Latour did an early article, uh, an interesting early article with Shirley Strong, who is a, she might be in San Diego, she's at one of the UC schools, she's an expert on baboons, and they wrote on baboons together. And what they noticed, Latour went with her on some field work, I think, they noticed that baboons are more social than we are. It's crazy, but they are, because they have to be watching each other all the time, and their position in the baboon rank is always changing, and they have to make sure they don't fall, and they have to make sure that no other baboon is giving a back rub to their mates, because then they have to go fight it. And so this constant life of baboons spying on each other to make sure they're not falling too far down the social ladder. We don't really have to do that. We have to do that once in a while. Like, <laughs> if you're going for a job interview, or trying to compete for a prize at school, or something like this, yes. But for the most part, in most times of your life, you wake up every morning knowing where you are in society. Not, you know, we all have times of uncertainty and crisis where we don't know. But when I wake up tomorrow, I'll know what my job is, I'll know what my name is, I'll know who my wife is, I'll know where I live, I'll know how much money I have in the bank, I'll know how much debt I have on certain credit cards, and so on. 
my social position is not that unstable. And what Latour's interesting contribution to this is to say that inanimate objects stabilize society for us. Right? I've got a wedding ring here to, to symbolize my marriage. I've got a bank account number that stabilizes my finance. I've got a driver's license here in my pocket that says I'm a resident of Iowa. Um, these are inanimate things. And most of our social arrangements are designed to separate us from each other, to stabilize our situation. He makes that joke that when he, he's going into the post office to buy stamps, and he says, thank God the man at the counter does not complain about his mother-in-law to me. Why? Because he's, he's selling you stamps. This is not the time for him to complain about his family to you. Sometimes you meet somebody who, who starts bringing up inappropriate subjects, but it's rare. Most of the time we know what to say in what situations to other people. Um, and so he says objects play this role in separating us. And the problem is that most modern political theory hinges on some theory of human nature. Are humans nice by nature, like Rousseau said? Are humans beasts by nature, like Hobbes and Machiavelli think? According to Latour and according to object-oriented ontology, it doesn't matter. Because politics is not really about human nature. Whether human nature is good or evil, human nature isn't where most politics plays out. We're probably good in some ways and evil in others, but where most politics plays out is with these objects that stabilize arrangements. And so probably a lot of political activism ought to go into making sure we set up our infrastructures the right way. Uh, Levi Bryant, my colleague, uh, often talks about this, how he doesn't understand why protesters are not trying to block key infrastructure more often than they are. Why are they outside the White House holding signs when Trump doesn't care about the signs anyway? Aren't there other things they could do that involve strangling the, the roads that trucks go on or things like this to stop certain policies? That's one. That's a, a left way of appropriating it. So the, anyway, to summarize, those are the two things that I think we can take from the tour. The fact that there is no political knowledge against modern assumptions and the fact that objects are actually more important than subjects in many ways. Um, and if, you, if some people complain that the left's problem is that they don't understand how bad human nature is and that human nature is permanent. You hear conservatives say this a lot. Human nature has always been bad. Just go back and read Roman history. People have always been raping and killing. There's no way to change that. Um, what you could say about the right as a criticism is that they think human nature is the point, when it really isn't. Yes, there have been bad and good people at all times, but that doesn't matter. We can still set things up in such a way to try to manage the bad side of human nature better, and that involves inanimate objects. Um, anyway. Let me just move on to, do I have time for my last? Okay, let me just say something briefly about history because I've written a whole book called Immaterialism about the Dutch East India Company. <laughs> and unlike the politics book, in this book I was writing against Bruno Latour to some extent because Latour is one of the founders of actor network theory. It's a dominant method in the social sciences around the world, many places. And what actor network theory says is that everything is an actor human or non-human, and everything is defined by what it does, not by what it is. And there are some problems with this. Uh, one of the problems is, since I do stuff and this marker does stuff, we're both the same kind of thing. There's just a, a difference of degree between me and this marker. Uh, this marker can be considered a political actor just as much as me, which is an exaggeration. <laughs> this marker is not going to do very much politically. I could. I can at least do a little bit. I voted already, for example, for the November election. I voted early. So I did something. This did nothing. Unless I'm going to make a political theory up here that influences you. But this is not very influential. And I wanted to account for the fact that some things have no effect at all. Like, I would say this is a good candidate for having no political effect at all. In some rare cases it might, but for the most part this is not a political actor in any sense. Um, the other thing is... I think actor network theory is too easily tricked by noisy events. So imagine a story that's the headline in the newspaper for five days in a row, and then next year it doesn't matter because it wasn't that important. It was just causing a lot of controversy. Maybe the really important thing was buried somewhere in the newspaper, <coughs> right? Like maybe the we had the headline for two weeks about Judge Kavanaugh. Was he doing these bad things when he was younger? He finally was voted on anyway. That seems very important to us now. Maybe in 10 years it won't really matter, but some iceberg breaking off of Antarctica happened the same time as Kavanaugh. We didn't pay any attention to it because we were distracted. So we need to account for the fact that not all the things that have the biggest effects are the most important. 
in the long term. So I, I wanted to look at the Dutch East India Company, which is the was the Dutch corporation that operated in what is now Malaysia and Indonesia, mostly Indonesia, back in the 1600s and 1700s. Why did I choose the Dutch East India Company? Because I'm interested in Leibniz as a philosopher. And you might remember Leibniz distinguishes between substance and aggregates. Substance is a real thing that exists by nature. It has a monad, it could be a flower, a person, a dog. All of these have monads. But, but um, Leibniz didn't think that aggregates could have a monad. And a corporation is a good example of an aggregate. Leibniz can't imagine that the Dutch East India Company is an object because it has so many different parts and they're not found together naturally. Somebody had to, had to put all these parts together. But still, it's an object, I would say. For one thing, the Dutch East India Company lasts longer than any of the people who were in it. It lasted almost 200 years. Nobody lived that long. Uh, the Dutch East India Company probably lasted longer than any of its ships. Its territory was constantly changing. World history was changing, and yet it was still the company in some sense, the same company from 1601 up through the 1790s when it was officially uh, shut down. Um, and so I wanted to look at what makes this an object. And I came up with the concept that it's, what's important about an object are not its effects, but its symbioses. And I, I mentioned this yesterday, but just to cover this again. It's a term I stole from biology. And there's a biologist who ought to be even more famous than she is, Lynn Margulis, M-A-R-G-U-L-I-S. Maybe she's translated into Spanish, or if not, maybe you want to read her in English. A good, way, a good place to start is Symbiotic Planets, a nice short book that has lots of ideas in it. And she was a very brave graduate student in the 1960s. Um, you know, the, the dominant idea of evolution in Darwin's paradigm is that it's gradual. That the big fish are eating the little fish and having bigger babies, and so over time the fish are getting bigger and stronger and meaner and have sharper teeth. It's a very gradual process. And there have always been some people who, who disagreed with that, but Lamar Goulis had perhaps the most interesting theory of it. Her, her theory was that evolution happens when two independent life forms combine into one. That's when it really happens, and that's irreversible. And her early theory was that the human cell probably contains some things that aren't supposed to be there. The DNA doesn't, doesn't code for those things. How do we get them then? How do we get these cell parts? They were originally independent bacteria or viruses, that came into our cells as parasites, but then over time we needed them because they also did good stuff for us, and so we formed a permanent relationship. And she predicted, back in the 60s, that if we can ever test the DNA of a cell, which happened in the 1980s finally, we will find that the DNA does not have code for all the parts of the human cell, which means that they came from outside. Fascinating theory. And she also, I mentioned yesterday, but I'll repeat for those who weren't here, she asked her professors, has there ever been evolution seen in a laboratory? And they said, there's one case. Maybe there's more now, but at the time there was one case. It involved fruit flies, where they put all the fruit flies in a tank and split the tank in half. One side, they slowly turn up the temperature every day. The other side, they slowly turn down the temperature every day. And so you have the hot fruit flies and the cold fruit flies. And after five or six months, they discover the fruit flies can no longer breed together. They're different species. And so they did as they always do, and they kill the poor fruit flies and dissect them. And they found, ah, the experiment is ruined because the hot fruit flies have a virus. The whole experiment is contaminated. And then Margulis said, no, that's the point. Why do you think these fruit flies could survive in the tank? It's because they picked up a virus symbiotically, and it became part of their cells. And this allowed them to survive in the heat, whereas the cold ones never did. There we have evolution right before our eyes. It involves a fruit fly merging with a virus and becoming a new species of fruit fly. And I started, I've always been fascinated by this. My master's advisor told me to read this back in the 90s, and immediately I saw it was important, but I never found a way to apply it to my own work. When I'm writing this book, I did. I started realizing we can look at a historical object like the Dutch East India Company in terms of symbiosis. There must have been five or six times in its history when it merged with some other object in such a way as to change, even though it was the same company. And so what's so important about it is not the birth of the Dutch East India Company, that, because a lot of things are born but then die quickly. They don't matter, right? So uh, the Dutch East India Company, I think, was born in 1601. 
The reason it was, this is interesting, uh, the, you know, the Dutch were breaking free of Spain and Portugal at the time. Uh, the Spanish crown had acquired the Netherlands through marriage. And the Dutch rebelled and became, wanted to stay an independent country. In order to do this, they had to get access to the spice markets on their own and not rely on the Portuguese, who were merged with Spain for part of that period as one country. And so the Dutch sent some ships out and the spices were all, I'm gonna draw a map here in a minute, but the spices were all in what's called the Spice Islands, which is the east part of Indonesia, close to New Guinea. The Dutch went over there and then the Dutch came back and they quickly realized this is counterproductive because we have all these different Dutch ships going and they're selling their spices and they're undercutting each other. So we need to create a state company, a state monopoly on spice. All Dutch ships must work under this monopoly. And this was the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, the VOC, the abbreviation in Dutch for this company. And here's the other interesting thing. Since Indonesia is so far away, we have to give them independent authority. They have to be able to declare wars when they want. They have to be able to sign contracts and treaties. And so in a way, it's going to be independent of the Dutch government. Also, anybody can buy stock in this company. It's the first corporation. Anybody in the Netherlands can buy shares in this company. They're taking the risk, and, but then if they get a lot of profit from the spice, and it was very profitable, all of these investors get a share. And not all the investors were rich. Some of them were middle class. It was The cost was within the, the uh, means of the average Dutch citizen. Okay, so that's how it was born. But it doesn't matter. Lots of things are born all the time and die. There are a lot of friendships that go nowhere, or institutions or companies that go bankrupt. Uh, what makes them stay alive is that they're able to form symbiosis with another object. And in trying to find these, I said, okay, you're, when you're making symbiosis, it's not with an action, because actions are what objects do. You're making symbiosis with another object. That's different from you. And an object is a noun, right? It's the part of speech. And we learn in school, at least, in the US, that a noun is a person, place, or thing. It's a, it's a mnemonic device you tell kids. Person, place, or thing counts as a noun. So I said, okay, what if we assume there's around a half dozen symbioses per object? And what if we assume that on average, two are people, two are places, and two are things? I just, that was my working hypothesis. Turned out not to be true in this case. I've got one person, three places, and one thing. So, who was the person? There was a position called Governor General, which was kind of like the CEO of the Dutch East India Company. This person, of course, was very powerful because there was no time to communicate with Amsterdam. They had to make very sudden decisions. And so this person ran the whole corporation and had its own army, its own navy, independent of the Dutch army and navy. Simply the profits had to go back to Amsterdam. The, the goods had to go back and be auctions. There was one governor general named Kuhn He was actually not a nice guy. He's a, kind of the most evil imperialist you can think of. But he was the most important person in the history of the company. Portugal had dominated this area of the world. Then came the Dutch and the British came later. The British kind of took over when the Dutch collapsed. But uh, what Kuhn said is, look, our country is in danger of dying. We're fighting this war of independence with Spain and Portugal. If we want to stay alive, we have to play hardball. We have to really be serious about this. We cannot let any other European countries trade in this area. We must have a monopoly for all of Europe. No other European countries will be allowed to buy spices here. We will destroy their ships. The second point is that we also can't let Asians sell to each other. We have to be the middleman for every business transaction between Chinese and, and Malaysians or between the Japanese and the Arabs. Everybody has to go through us. That's the only way we can make enough money to survive as a country. It's called the Discourse on the State of India. It's a famous thing he wrote, and he sent it back to Amsterdam. And as you may remember, Amsterdam was a very liberal place. Spinoza lived there, and, and, and Descartes also lived there for a time because it was so liberal. And so this treatise, which was saying we have to commit all these violent acts to keep our position high, uh, sickened the people in Amsterdam somewhat. They didn't feel good about it. They sort of agreed with it, but then a few years later they changed their minds. They made a peace with England, and they said, start giving England a third of our spices as part of the peace. Kern was furious because he had already defeated the British in all these battles. He didn't want to share his spices with the British. 
And so he very cleverly arranged for his assistant to massacre some British on an island, Ambon. And of course, after that, the peace with England was dead. This man, in an evil way, arranged for his own soldiers to massacre some British so that England would not want peace with them, and there would be a state of war. So he's the first important person, even if a very bad one. He was the one who told them it has to be a violent monopoly. No one else can earn any profit here except the Netherlands. Okay. Now, let me jump ahead and tell you the, the thing that's important. Uh, about 1625, which is about 20 years into this, they realize we're focusing too much on ships coming from Amsterdam to here, and then we load the ships with spices, then they go back to Amsterdam. These very big ships. It takes a long time. The other problem is that in, in Asia, a lot of the rivers and ports are not very deep. They're shallow, and so these big ships can't even go into them. So this was hurting the Dutch ability to trade with Asian countries. And so they decided, okay, from now on, we're going to focus more on Asian trade. And so they started building smaller boats. They started capturing boats from the Chinese and Portuguese and using them. They started building boats there instead of building them in Amsterdam. And so it became less a European company even than it was before. It became more of an Asian company that was trading with Asians and bullying Asians too, but trading with them. So that was the thing. Now for the other part, which is places, I have to draw you a map here. And I'm a terrible artist, but just, I'll give you a crude map of the area. <laughs> and today these are the independent countries of Indonesia and Malaysia. Basically Indonesia is the former Dutch colonies and Malaysia is the former British colonies. Um, yeah, I'll draw this. Again, I apologize for what's going to be a terrible map. <laughs> this is Sumatra. And there was a lot of pepper here on this coast. And then there's this. this. This here is called the Strait of Malacca. Or maybe it's Malacca. I'm not sure how to pronounce it correctly. Singapore today is here, but there was no Singapore then. And so this is Malaysia today, and this is Thailand. And then finally, there's Java. Well, not finally, there's a couple more. And then there's Borneo played less of a role in this story. And there's Sulawesi, which looks kind of like a lizard. And the Spice Islands are here. They're actually smaller than this, but they're part of Indonesia today. So there are really three, only three really important places on this map of Indonesia and Malaysia. Spice Islands is where the spice is, of course. Not Meg and Mace, I don't know what you call them in Spanish. Nutmeg and mace, two spices. At the time, this was the only place in the world where those grew. There was no other place in the world where you could get nutmeg and mace in the 1600s. So what did the Dutch do? First of all, they made sure nobody else could take these. They could sell these for 50 times their purchase price back in Amsterdam. It was a huge monopoly, they were a hugely profitable monopoly. Here's the other thing they would do. There are some islands that are far away that had spices. They didn't want the Chinese or Japanese or Spanish to get them, so they go and cut down all the trees. Destroy all the spice trees, except on the islands the Dutch control. So it was an environmental disaster and a political disaster because they were killing anybody who tried to get the spice. They would go and capture these people and either kill them or make them slaves. And they would use these slaves locally. So it was a human rights disaster, but hugely profitable. Okay, there are two other obvious important places. You can see here and here. These are the only two ways to get back to Europe efficiently. The Dutch first tried this, to capture this, they failed. 1606, 1608, they failed. Then they came here. There was a port here called Banzan, which was the ultimate free market port. It was Arabs, Turks, Japanese, Chinese, uh, Malaysians, Spanish and Portuguese, everybody was trading here freely. The Dutch didn't want that, they wanted a monopoly. And again, it's not just because they were evil, it's because in order to justify this corporation, they needed huge profit margins. They couldn't afford free trades. They wanted monopoly capitalism. And because there were all these other nationalities here, the Dutch made a new capital here, which you've heard of. It was called Jayakarta. Now it's called Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. It's 50 miles east. 
and this is the second important, most important place on the map. They were able to use this as their base. And this was a Dutch colony until the 60s, I believe. Um, this is the Dutch East Indies. <coughs> Finally, they were able to get this about 30 years later. It took a long time, but they were able to get this too. So now they control everything. And this is also important because you had the Chinese trade routes here and you had the Arab trade routes over here. This place conquering it allowed them to combine the two. So just to repeat, I, decided, I concluded that there were five symbioses in the history of this corporation. Kuhn, who wrote this evil treatise saying we have to have a monopoly and use violence. There was the switch from large ships to smaller ships that could trade around Asia and go up rivers. That changed the nature of the company from a European trading company to an inside Asia company. And then these three places, this being the most important, because you can't have a company without the spices. This one, which was their capital, and they didn't even bother to conquer this until 50 years later because it was so much less important than this. And then this finally. So those are the five things. Once those five things symbiosed with the company, it had reached mature form. And that's another part of the theory. That everything, everything, every person, including you, has room for five or six symbioses, people, places, and things that you form an attachment with. They're initially loose attachments. Over time, you become more and more committed to those attachments. And that is the seed of your downfall and of company's downfall. Because what happens? The Dutch East India Company made a very tight link with spices. And they became richer and richer and richer for 70, 80 years, maybe 90 years. Then what happens in the early 1700s? People stopped wanting spices as much. Partly they were, they were getting boring. Partly the French were setting up new spice plantations in Caribbean and were able to sell those in Europe. What started becoming interesting to people was tea and chocolate and coffee. The Dutch knew about coffee, but they weren't interested in it. They, there's a funny letter where they say, the people in Yemen have this drink called, they have a small black bean called kahua, and they make black water out of it, and they drink the black water. The Dutch are kind of puzzled by this. It's coffee. It came from Ethiopia, went to Yemen. The Dutch didn't see the potential of this, uh, that this was going to become a huge crop that all of us consume every day, or most of us. So it was the British who controlled the tea, the chocolate, and the coffee. And so it was the British who started rising, the Dutch went into decline, and so you could say that after the symbiosis, the Dutch East India Company reaches mature form, it's an adult object, it rises, has a period of decadence, and finally it's killed off when Napoleon invades the Netherlands in 1794. Um, actually, it was one step before that. The real downfall happened a few years earlier when the Dutch were having a war here, and they couldn't win the war themselves, so the Dutch Navy had to come help them. Even though this company is Dutch, they're supposed to be independent. They have their own navy, their own army. And so dependence on the home country was a disaster for them because it meant the home country took control of the company. And it became the Dutch East Indies, which was a colony until the 1960s. When Indonesia, I think it was the 60s, maybe it was the 50s, Indonesia became independent. And Malaysia became independent from the British. But until then, it was a colonial area. And as I mentioned, if you want to see another example, if you read my book, Object Oriented Ontology, from Pelican, came out in the spring. I talk about the American Civil War um, and tried to analyze it in the same way. That there are usually around five or six relations that can be symbiotic, and they what, what makes them symbiotic is they're irreversible. For example, Kern's treatise saying we need a violent monopoly. Once they massacred the British on one of these islands, it was irreversible. The British were not going to make peace with them after that. They just killed 25 British citizens. So he, he was sneaky enough to know that was the way to do it. Murder a bunch of the British to end the, the, the peace deal with the British. And the same with this. Once it became a spice company, all of its ships and all of its equipment were meant for spices, and so they couldn't easily switch to tea or chocolates. We had an example of this in America yesterday. Sears filed for bankruptcy. You know Sears, the, I don't know if they ever came into Mexico, but Sears was the biggest department store chain in the US for over a century, they've been killed by Amazon. Everybody goes online. Not in Mexico? Not in Mexico? No, Mexico is a very good business. Yeah. So do people don't buy Amazon yet here? No, not much? yet. It'll come, watch, they'll try. <laughs> <laughs> they'll try to destroy our stores. I, I do too, I, I 
order books from Amazon because they're fast. And, and so there are fewer and fewer bookstores in the US, unfortunately, because Amazon is killing them. Sooner or later, Amazon will have to become under control because it's just getting gigantic. Right? It's, it's swallowing everything, just like Walmart did before that. There's always some dominant business that rises up and destroys the other. Well, the same thing will happen to Amazon. Eventually, business will change and Amazon will die. Who knows when? Maybe 200 years from now, or maybe 20 years from now. We don't know. Because this company was too attached to spices. As soon as Europeans lose interest in spice and the profits go down, it's the company. It's only a matter of time before the company dies. So uh, I'm looking forward to expanding this into other examples. I want to write a whole book about something. And as I mentioned yesterday, I want to choose something nonviolent next time. It's it depressing. <laughs> depressing writing about all this exploitation and then writing about the American Civil War, which is still our bloodiest war. I'm looking for the appropriate nonviolent example. Uh, of a historical object. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you. You've all been listening very nicely again today, and this is a good time to stop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, by the way, this is the book the professor was talking about, Immaterialism. Very engaging book because here it is the, uh, the story about the BOC. How the the Dutch, the Holandeses, you know, conquer the Spice Island, and so we have a a few minutes. If you have a, any questions or commentaries for the professor, don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can expand in the, 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 the distinction between, um, well, uh, yesterday we were, we were uh, discussing about this, but, but I'm still uh, processing it. Mm -hmm. The distinction between a new object sure. and a sign symbiosis. Yeah. Um, uh, specifically, if we talk about this uh, fruit fly and, and uh, the virus, um, in, in, in a biologist could say that it's a new object. And not a, a face of one object that already exists because it's a new species. But but you are talking about a new face, not a, not, not a new object. So maybe you can expand right. on that. Yeah, this was the tough question you asked in the interview last night at Las Plas. Um He's asking about what's the difference between two objects uniting to form a new object, like hydrogen, oxygen, making water, or a symbiosis where you have the fruit fly plus the virus. The difference is that the connection remains looser in the second case. That's, that's why it's a symbiosis and not a brand new object. Um, and as I mentioned, loose connections can be more powerful in some way. Uh, sometimes it's better to keep the two parts of a thing independent rather than trying to merge them. So, um, and of course this is the problem they have in the European Union, how to connect the countries without connecting them too closely. So that, in a way, to destroy the individual nations. Um, and we, in, in the United States, we have this problem too. How much rights should the states have compared to the, the federal government? But generally, a, when two objects unite to form a new object, that's a literal connection. Whereas a symbiosis is more like a metaphorical connection. Uh, to, to bring that concept in literature, so. Um, it's almost like a metaphor. The Dutch East India Company is like a spice company. It doesn't sound like a metaphor, but it is in a way. It's like a spice supplier. Then what happens is the connection becomes too close. You know how metaphors can die when they're repeated too much? Like in English, window comes from the old Saxon word wind eye. It's an eye where you can look out on the wind. And that's beautiful. It's very poetic, but we don't think of that anymore. We don't know that anymore. We just say window. It's a literal word. And every, almost every word has an interesting etymology when you look at it, it's poetic in some way. Um, so, metaphorical things or symbiotic things can become literalized too much, and when they become literalized too much, they lose interest. So the, the connection between the Vok and Spice became too literalized. It became too committed to Spice operations, it was unable to change, just like Sears yesterday, paid the price, they were too connected to large stores with lots of things on display. It's a huge waste of money in today's economy. It was very important into the old model of business. 
But today it's better for Amazon to just send the things as soon as you order them. And you can see pictures of them on the website anyway. So people like that today. Eventually Amazon will die too, down the line. Uh, because the conditions under which it was born will change. It will no longer be there. And so yes, I would, uh, the symbiotic connections are like metaphorical ones. And so they remain loose. The connection between wine dark and sea is pretty loose because the color of the sea is not quite like that of wine. It's sort of like that. Um, that's why metaphors are stronger because they're making connections between things that seem different. Except that whereas when you say a pen is like a pencil, it's not interesting because we know both a pen and a pencil can write. So uh, metaphor, the power of metaphor has always interested me. It seems to have a kind of magic power that everyday language doesn't have. And I think you see the same thing happening in the case of these symbioses with the Dutch East India Company. Christopher. What, what, did you, <coughs> me, what did you mean when you said there is no political knowledge? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Yesterday I was talking about knowledge and how there's only two kinds of knowledge, undermining and overmining. Undermining is when you... If someone asks you what something is, there are really only two answers you can give. You can tell them what it's made of, you can tell them what it does. So if somebody asks me what is water, I can say it's made of hydrogen, two hydrogens and an oxygen, or I can say it quenches thirst and puts out fires, and it's essential for the bodily functions. Neither of those really gives you what the water is itself. They either tell you what the smaller parts are that make the water, or they tell you what water can be used for. And that's knowledge, and it's very useful. But it doesn't really give you any sense of the water itself. And uh, metaphorical language and indirect language can do that better than propositional language. Propositional language always says this certain object has the following qualities. And this is what science does. We need science to do this. We need science to not just say the word water, but to study it and find out what water can do and what its chemical properties are. But knowledge does not cover all of human cognition. There are a lot of things that are not knowledge, like arts like philosophy, philosophia, according to Socrates. He never gives a, def a successful definition of anything. There's something there he can never get because humans are always ignorant. And so I think when I say there's no political knowledge, I'm saying it in the same way Socrates would. That, remember, Socrates went to all the politicians in Athens and he asked them, what is justice? And he didn't like any of their answers. He found out that they were ignorant, but at least he knows he's ignorant. It puts him on a higher level than them. And so there's, you know, there are political techniques and there, there's political know-how and there's some good rules of thumb about things to avoid in politics. But no one is ever sure what's going to happen and no one is ever sure which policies are the best ones. We have some idea. We have some idea that this tax cut of Trump is only going to benefit the rich. I'm pretty sure about that, but I don't know it for sure. It could have strange effects that we're not expecting. Uh, sometimes policies backfire against the people who, who posted them. So, uh, who knows? No one really knows how Brexit is going to work out for the United Kingdom. I think it's going to be a disaster. But there are people who think it's going to be very good for the British economy, and time will tell. Um, that's what I mean by no political knowledge. That was a, a very good question, Christopher. Yes. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm an architect. So it's, it's towards architecture. Sure. I think architects uh, at the moment are fetishizing the object. And uh, I can see how some architects can uh, misunderstand your ontology and literally start because architects are, are in love with the object and the production of the object and the immediacy of the object mm -hmm. and the effects it can, uh, it can produce. Mm -hmm. And uh, with your idea of symbiosis, uh, I think that's one, uh, one of the uh, strengths of, of your ontology that's totally being misread by architects. Do you agree, or are there, are, because as I know, Tom Wiscombe is very formalist, uh, mm -hmm. like the Mark, which he had a huge uh, 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 talk with Patrick Schumacher in Texas. I saw it. And, yeah, it was amazing too, and, and they, they really hit Schumacher, and he deserves some, some of those uh, questions. But I do, I do uh, question the way that Mark is doing work, and also Tom Wiscombe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would, I would really like your opinion on uh, on how symbiosis can uh, 
play a, a large role in the construction of, of, of ideas in architecture rather than the object. You're the first person I've heard suggest symbiosis for architecture could come out of this. I actually haven't heard that, but that's a good idea. That maybe people want to work with that a bit. It's not not something I heard. So maybe you're the first. Unless there's people out there talking about it. I don't know. <laughs> that's a really good idea. Maybe if you have any thoughts, email me. You can find my <laughs> No, because I'd like if you have an article about this, I can use it in my class. I'm serious. I had not thought of that. But that symbiosis is one idea that at least the people at Cyrock haven't picked out of my works yet that I know about. They, they, they could have potential. And yes, in one way they're fetishizing objects, but in another way there's a counter reaction to that. So all the Pritzker Prizes recently have gone to more political things. So there's also a movement that, that architecture shouldn't just be making cool objects, it should also be helping poor people around the world. Or it should um, be forgetting about philosophies and getting back to the techniques of architecture that it knows how to do. So there are those anti-object pushes as well. And, a lot of the criticism I've gotten from, our, from architects, for example, that whole issue in phenomenology that was edited by Brian Norwood, Log 42, was, was kind of an anti-object-oriented pushback. Um, and it was based on those two things, the politics, and let's, you know, philosophers should shut up and let architects do their work. We don't need your theories. Those are kind of the two arguments against us. Um, maybe, maybe symbiosis is another powerful thing to put in the toolbox. I really hadn't thought of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right, yeah, I almost still to take uh, talk about symbiosis. Right. Uh, I was, uh, somebody at MSNBC the other day was uh, speaking about how political rhetoric, political ideology was being replaced by uh, management and by neoliberalism. Yes. And uh, this is obvious. This is something that is happening. Like uh, uh, the uh, left-right discourse is being uh, replaced by this. And uh, I was thinking that maybe it's, uh, maybe symbiosis can explain this as well. Maybe it's uh, the political rhetoric, it's it's, uh, it's way of surviving for the 21st century. Like it, it's, it's its way of uh, being still relevant. It's merging with uh, neoliberalism and with uh, technocratical explanations of government and leaving beside uh, ideology. Just wanted to see your take on it. I think that's right. Um, I would consider neoliberal management ideology to be a form of overmining. Uh, it thinks that you can adequately calculate everything that happens in the economy and you can make decisions based on that and Heidegger would be appalled. Um, this is the inframing, this is Techno das Gestell. Um, and Bruno Latour has already done something against this. At the end of his book, uh, Modes of Existence, Inquiry into Modes of Existence, his big system from 2012, he tries to break up economics into three different modes. He says there isn't just one mode, there's attachment, organization, and morality that all come together. And so he's trying to decompose economics because he, um, he has a funny passage in his book. He says where if you ask economists a moral question, they'll say, shh, I'm calculating. It's one of the funniest parts of the book. Um, because yes, there's this idea there that, the, that all the features of the economy can be known in a kind of mathematical way. Um, put in equations or put in other kinds of prose discourse that can explain exactly what's happening in the economy, even though no economists ever agree on anything, right? No one ever agrees what, what's going to be best, or maybe it's once in a while, but usually, you know, there, there's, there's the one economist that works for Trump who thinks trade deficits are really bad, and that's why they're starting all these trade wars. What's that guy's name? Forgetting it now. And then, you know, most practicing economists don't think it matters. Most of them are free traders, at least in the US. But then you get a small number of them who think that it's a disaster that we have a huge trade deficit with China. And Steve Bannon thinks this is going to destroy the United States in 30 years unless we really crack down on China. You can't really get any unanimous economic advice about these sorts of things. Um, let alone the fact that there are ethical and moral things that come into play that can't be calculated. I mean, th this is a problem too, right? Because for example, when the United States builds a highway through the mountains, they have to put a dollar value on human lives because they have to say, okay, how many people are likely to fall off this mountain and die unless we put a, a guardrail? And then they'll say, okay, we assume each life is worth a million dollars. So if three people per year are going to die on this road and it's gonna cost $50 million to build the guardrail, it's not worth it. You just let the three people per year die. Or you, you might have known about the famous 1970s case of the Ford Pinto 
car, which was exploding when people crashed in behind because the gas tank was in the back. We teach this in business ethics classes because they could have fixed this problem for $16 per car by just putting some rubber plug into the gas tank. There would have been no explosions. But they calculated, okay, how many people are going to sue us for dying in explosions? <laughs> it's going to be about 75 per year and it's going to cost this much. Oh, that's cheaper than putting the $16 plug in each car. So let's just not <laughs> put it in. And then I don't know how many people died. It was hundreds died in explosions. And then of course they lost even more money from being sued after that. So it was a horrible business decision on top of a horrible human decision. Uh, Ford paid the price for that. But yeah, so yeah, there's some obvious holes in economics. I would consider an overmining method par excellence. And neoliberalism is a kind of economism that thinks everything can be explained as a market. Yeah. Rebuttal? Sure. Well, it's just a follow-up question. Isn't uh, the adoption of neoliberalism instead of ideology a sort of symbiosis? That, that's my question. Oh, a symbiosis between what and what? Ideology and pragmatism. Interesting. Um, is, is a relation to an ideology a kind of symbiosis? I'd never thought of that before. It's an inter interesting possibility. Um, yeah, because I suppose it could because an ideology is an object. Um, and so you could form a symbiosis with an ideology. You could, oh well, yeah, yeah, the Republican Party has formed a symbiosis with this Trumpian ideology, which is very different from what the party used to believe. The party used to be free trade party. All Republicans believed, or almost all Republicans believed in trade with other countries, capitalism, open borders, at least economically open borders. Now Trump has convinced the whole Republican Party to be protectionist and not trade with other countries uh, as much. See, that, that's, yeah, I, I just hadn't thought of that. I hadn't thought about a negative symbiosis like of that sort. Yeah, yeah it could be. Any other question? Question, opinions, commentaries? Uh, my counter was more towards uh, aesthetics, the first thing you covered. Uh, and when you were speaking about Greenberg, I'm not sure if you were agreeing with him or not, uh, about the content being irrelevant uh, of an artwork, uh, loosely connected artwork you mentioned. But what about, uh, for example, in poetry that we know that form and content are inseparable? What, what's your position on that? Yeah. I think he would not agree that form and content are inseparable in literature. Because he says somewhere that Joyce is writing about writing and Mallarmé is poetry about poetry. So that would be his reading. He would say that it's not really content in the old sense just like the content of a Picasso Cubist painting isn't really content in the old sense. Um, no, what I disagree with Greenberg about, I agree with a lot of the things he says, but I, what I disagree with is the idea that all the content is just there as a prop to, to hint at the background, which is one and the same background for the whole painting. And so he tends to like artists who have totally flat content, whether it's, it's Picasso in his Cubist phase, or it's uh, Mondrian, or it's Miro, uh, it's a kind of content that serves only to kind of put the whole painting in quotation marks and say, I realize I'm a flat painting on a flat canvas. He, he never really analyzes the content very well of the painting. And the reason I disagree with that is because I think each piece of content has its own background and therefore the individual content becomes more important. You know, um, famously, uh, Greenberg hates Salvador Dali because he says, all right, Dali paints a bunch of weird objects, but it's still basically 19th century academic oil painting where you have three-dimensional landscape and it looks like you're looking out a window. And therefore, it's, it's, he calls it academic art. Dali's an academic artist, which is, sounds kind of funny, um, you know, considering these giant skinny elephants and flaming giraffes and ghosts that are tables with drinks on them and uh, these sorts of things. Now, the problem with that is uh, Dali's content is important. It is disruptive in a way to our normal way of perceiving. So I think surrealism is more important than, than Greenberg thinks. He thinks it's just junk. There's no importance to surrealism for him. I think that's a mistake because there is importance to the content and we have to find a way to recover the content without returning to the old literal content where we think every novel has a message. Like the message of Moby Dick is don't fight evil too hard. You might become more evil than what you're fighting. That, that's, one of the, that's one of the summaries of Moby Dick, the novel. Uh, don't fight evil in inappropriate ways because you become more evil than what you fight. Okay. That's a pretty good summary of what Moby Dick is about, but it sort of ruins the novel too. If you think it can be boiled down to one lesson like that, it's a literal content. 
Uh, so we have to find a way to deal with the content that doesn't do that. Zizek has a really funny passage where uh, he's talking, of, it's in the Parallax View, if you know that book. He's talking about a series in the United States called Shakespeare Made Easy. It's a funny book series. So on the left side is Shakespeare, and on the right is Shakespeare translated into everyday American English. <laughs> it's really funny. So over here you have Hamlet, it says, to be or not to be, that is the question. Here, my problem now is, should I kill myself? <laughs> <laughs> and on the one hand, it's helpful as a teaching device, but on the other, it just ruins the play, right? Yeah. And uh, Zizek gives another funny example. He says, imagine that they take Holderlin's poem, where the danger is, there too is the saving power. And he says, let's translate that into, if you're ever in trouble, don't worry. The solution might be just around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, when you literalize art like that, you're in serious danger of destroying it. And H.P. Lovecraft, the horror writer whom I love, uh, is mocked mercilessly by Edmund Wilson, who is one of our greatest literary critics, by literalizing. He, he says, um, the problem is that all that Lovecraft writes about is a race of prehistoric gods who appear usually in Massachusetts, and they blast their enemies with terrible winds. And then he says, well, this is junk, you know, only a teenager would read this. But then in my book, Weird Realism, I showed you can do the same with Moby Dick, and you can do it with Dante. Any of it sounds stupid if you put it, you know, it's Dante. A 35-year-old poet is walking through a forest and leopards and lions are chasing him. And then he just happens to run into the ghost of Virgil. <laughs> and they walk down through hell. And then, then he meets his dead childhood sweetheart and they fly and see Jesus and God at the end. It, it sounds ridiculous. You wouldn't know that it's one of the greatest poems ever written, just by the literal summary. Um, so, yeah, some, some way has to be found of dealing with content in a non-literal way. I think that's what, what good critics do. Okay, so Professor, uh, I just want to say that your your presentation, like yesterday, was very clear, very precise. Uh, you made it, you make it easy to understand English, and I just want to say to the philosophy students, Alonso, Christopher. Uh, the ones at Servicio Social. <laughs> uh, this is a great opportunity for you to observe how uh, an American philosopher, an American thinker, uh, constructs a philosophical device. For instance, Professor Harman uh, has four concepts overmining, undermining, dual mining, immaterialism. That's the workhorse. Here in Mexico, we make philosophy in a more chaotic way. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that it is important to, to see how the Americans do philosophy. I'm not sure many of them do it the way I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I, I noticed that you the philosophy of objects, as, a, as I said yesterday, for me, there's, there's a potentiality in your approach to objects. But for me, there's also another discourse on, on objects. And maybe, Maybe there will be a symbiosis between the... <laughs> I'm talking about the... When we study objects in philosophy here in Mexico, most of the time we follow what you will say is a 
and let's take point of view. Objects are like commodities. Objects are related to consumerism. And I think that your approach to objects, and I will refer to, to your words in one of your books, uh, Professor Harman uh, says that he's going to make justice for objects. Okay? And, and that's a, a good idea because we think through objects. And then in, I agree that in philosophy, some, sometimes we forget that our thought is, is influenced by objects. For instance, uh, you are seated and I'm standing and there's this, this thing in front of me <laughs> and there is no, no object in front of you. So this is affecting my thinking. That's the, the study of objects. But there's another way to study objects. Uh, the one that I mentioned uh, as the consumerism, the commodities approach, the Marxist approach to, to objects. So I think that that uh, we have to to learn to use both uh, approaches you know, to to objects, and well, that is what, what I wanted to say to to you, and I want to uh, congratulate you, and I want to say that he's a a, a good guy, a good man. <laughs> he was very kind. Yeah, I wrote an email to him, inviting him to come to our university, he said yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of That's symbiosis. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a kind person. He, he's a very busy professor, so, so he, he opened space uh, for us. No? And as, as I said, Professor, it is important for, us, for our students to listen uh, thinkers in another language mm. and to see how they construct philosophy. Learn. <laughs> Learn that. <laughs> and compare to the way we do philosophy here. That's the point. And so, uh, I am, we are very grateful, Professor, for your visit. We enjoyed it. And finally, on behalf of the School of Humanities, it is an honor and a privilege for me to present you with this certificate of appreciation as a token of uh, uh, gratitude towards your philosophical work and your visit to Wabese, to the School of Humanities. Congratulations. so kind and I hope the next time I lecture here will be in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's amazing to have this other world just across the border with its own university system and its own uh, culture. It's a, it, it was a, a strange experience for me to <laughs> by us and I see San Diego across the border as a foreign city. It was fascinating to me. <laughs> see that? Yeah, there it is. So thank you all. I was happy to meet you all and thank you for being such great listeners. Uh, so thank you for coming and have a Good afternoon. Bye. Bye.